Welcome to Fiction Narratives. Chapter 111, Zaytna Zaytara falls into the clutches of a perverted demon. Zaytna Zaytara, daughter of the magician John Zaytara, inherited impressive magical abilities from an early age. Her life has been intertwined with the world of magic and the occult ever since. Although her initial training was as an illusionist, she eventually embraced her true legacy as a sorceress. Zaytna's main goal in life is to balance her duality as a powerful mage and a defender of justice. She fights evil using her magical abilities and seeks to explore and understand the vast world of the occult, unraveling mysteries and facing supernatural dangers. Speaking of her personality, Zaytna is a charismatic and self-assured woman, with a unique blend of charm, wit, and determination. She is loyal to her friends and allies, willing to risk everything to protect them. She is often described as intelligent and perceptive, capable of solving problems both with magic and cunning. However, she also carries the weight of her family legacy and sometimes struggles with the responsibility it entails. In Zaytna's eyes, Alan was one of her main enemies, a demon, an evil being that lives to destroy, dominate, and consume. You're quite peculiar, but I cannot allow you to exist in this plane, said Zaytna as she looked down from the sky. Alan remained surrounded by demonic magic, which made her unable to see that he wasn't a demon. In the end, Alan was the villain, regardless of whether they thought he was human or not, so he did not bother to correct the misunderstanding. Zaytna pointed her hand at Alan, and a powerful energy beam shot out from her palm. With her other hand, she pointed at the policeman, and behind them, a door to another place appeared. Zaytna frowned. Leave immediately, she said gravely feeling a strange sensation in her chest as she fought against Alan. Alan appeared behind Zaytna and whispered in her ear, I see you're strong, but you seem a bit nervous. Is it your first time? Zaytna did not lose focus with Alan's teasing and she cast a spell, and her words came out backward. In fact, all of Zaytna's spells are pronounced backward. Multiple swords manifested around Alan, all aimed at him, and she didn't hesitate to attack. I see, in a second, you saw that I have super speed, so an omnidirectional attack would work, right Alan sighed with admiration, not mockery. Analyzing the unknown with a cool head and finding a solution demonstrates a high level of combat and thanks to her command of magic, Zaytna is a formidable enemy and an incredible ally. However, he he. All the swords stopped before touching Alan. Zaytna opened her eyes wide at this unexpected power. She did not stop her attack and summoned a spear embedded with an armor penetration spell and hurled it toward Alan. Alan dodged a spear that Zaytna had manifested and counterattacked with shadow tentacles that appeared through portals around her. She cast a spell backward, and a shield appeared around her, disintegrating the tentacles with powerful electrical discharges. The fight escalated and Zaytna began to use more magic. Zaytna's constant attacks were easy to dodge. She threw multiple weapons and rays, but Alan dared to chat with his chat while fighting. Equals equals equals. Her father was an amazing magician, and her mother is no slouch either, being a homo magi capable of controlling magic from birth, Alan said, looking interestedly at the woman. In DC, magicians are incredible, whether in power or status, even Superman himself is vulnerable to magic. Yes, she's a love on occasion, she's been the most powerful member of the Justice League. MMM, but then why in this universe do Superman and even Green Lantern seem stronger than her, of course, that depends on the specific DC Earth. Equals equals equals. Alan smiled at the beautiful raven-haired woman, but inside, he felt relieved. She's like everyone else. He had already realized this when he saw Supergirl as a rookie, but the real confirmation came with Dick Grayson, who was still Robin. There's also an inexperienced Batgirl Barbara, a penguin who barely reached the position of crime lord, a beautiful poison ivy at 23, and a Zaytna who, while showing signs of nervousness, still faced him. Alan realized it was early in the DC timeline, there's a chance that many superheroes and supervillains don't even exist yet, but this is also good, if Zaytna had a few more years, Alan would have to take her seriously. Ignoring Alan's thoughts, Zaytna took her top hat and pulled out a magic wand from it, not like the wands of Harry Potter wizards but more like a modern magician's wand. Every move she made had grace, making you blink. Alan couldn't deny that Zaytna's appearance was attractive, 
but this woman had been able to face the power of Mr. MXYZPTLK, that small being from the fifth dimension capable of altering reality on a large scale as if it were a living infinity gauntlet. Alan must not let his guard down, even if Zaytna is nice and perhaps not an incredibly strong version of herself. One regrettable thing is that, like Flash, she has to be relegated to the background sometimes, she's even used only to teleport other heroes or as a consultant. Zaytna stopped attacking when she saw that Alan wasn't responding and was just dodging her attacks. You don't seem like a conventional demon, she said lightly as she created a ball of light in her hands. If you're willing to return peacefully, I wouldn't mind ignoring you. Her job is to protect the earthly world, not to defeat demons, and besides, Alan hadn't killed anyone, so she could still resolve this peacefully. Alan shrugged with a smile. I'm not a horrifying monster, but I'm not a good person either. You should be more careful and not trust appearances, darling. Alan paused and looked Zaytna up and down with a predatory smile. Besides, I still don't want to go back. After all, I found something I desire, said Alan with a mysterious voice. Zaytna felt uncomfortable and embarrassed being seen by Alan, to the point where she hid her cleavage from him. Alan laughed and took advantage of Zaytna's distraction, appearing close to her while holding her hand with the wand and covering Zaytna's mouth with his other hand. Despite being a powerful mage, I find your choice of dressing so casual, are you trying to seduce me, Miss Zaytna? Zaytna couldn't help but exclaim at his audacity. Equals equals equals. Wednesday, if all demons were like Alan, humanity would have been enslaved by them long ago. All the spectators attended Wednesday's comment. Equals equals equals. Zaytna became furious as her face flushed. She bit Alan's hand to push him away. Alan laughed, and after successfully flirting with her, he backed away as if escaping. Come on, it was just a joke Alan winked. This time there was no trick, Alan liked Zaytna, but it seemed unfair to him that she always remained in the background. So, he was going to put her in an antagonistic position to feel more compelled to defeat him. You are a despicable demon. Zaytna, feeling insulted, attacked Alan with several concentrated energy rays that caused great destruction upon impact on the ground. However, the common people had already run far away from here a long time ago. Alan decided to be more active and levitated several empty cars with Alastor's magic and threw them at Zaytna. Huh. She was surprised not by the attack since she could do the same without effort, but the magic of the human demon in front of her was too strange. Who or what is he? Being half homo magi, Zaytna was very sensitive to magic and its changes, which made her very confused every time Alan used magic. She cast a very powerful spell and summoned a giant sword in the sky. Alan smiled as the attack headed towards him. Zaytna's hand glowed as she prepared another spell to immobilize Alan. What she exclaimed in amazement when she saw that Alan had no intention of dodging. The sword fell at great speed, and Alan extended his hand and caught it with a loud bang as the ground beneath him broke into pieces. Zaytna's blue eyes remained fixed on Alan as she saw the monstrous strength he possessed. I'll have to take this very seriously. Declared Zaytna as her eyes lit up with magic, but at that moment, Alan disappeared from her sight, no, he even disappeared from her perception. Damn it. Zaytna raised her alarms when she saw him disappear, having a bad feeling. Her blood froze as she felt Alan's presence behind her. She is not afraid of death, her way of seeing the world was different from that of a common person, but it was very unpleasant to end so soon. Not long ago, she had accepted her inheritance, believing she could investigate and learn more about the mysteries of the world. Zaytna imagined that in the next second, she would be pierced by a claw or something worse. Instead, she was embraced by Alan's arm. I'm not an abuser. But I have a fair exchange rule. If a beautiful lady attacks me or even tries to kill me, I have the freedom to take benefits from her, doesn't that seem fair to you? Dot you. Alan covered Zaytna's mouth once again so she couldn't use spells and then pulled her clothes while placing his mouth on her ear, but this time it wasn't to speak. Zaytna was paralyzed for a moment, then felt Alan's hand caressing her abdomen, and she felt completely embarrassed. Hmm. Zaytna felt Alan lightly bite her earlobe and then use his tongue to lick it. A pleasant tingling ran through her body, making her feel weak. Damn degenerate. 
Zaytna was cursing Alan inside as she tried to bite the hand covering her mouth, but this time it didn't seem to work. It never worked, Alan was just playing when he let her go the first time. I'm sorry, I'm a monster. I would like to kill you and all that, but I couldn't help but be drawn to such a beautiful woman, Alan said with a mocking tone as he continued to tease her. He was sure that after this, Zaytna would pursue him all over the world in revenge. She would be his first real nemesis in his supervillain career. Unable to free herself, Zaytna regretted it. She had never worried about her provocative attire before, as it was the way she dressed for her job as an illusionist. But now, for the first time, she thought it wasn't such a good idea to dress like this when facing villains and demons. She was now at the mercy of a perverted demon because of it. HHHG. Haha, <laughs> Alan laughed at her cute reactions and bit her earlobe. MHHH no Zaytna felt humiliated, but more than by Alan's actions, it was the fact that her body was responding. Zaytna, he's a demon, what are you doing? NHHHGG she groaned again as her body yielded and leaned against Alan's chest. Alan leaned in and whispered something in Zaytna's ear, which wasn't heard by anyone else. Equals equals equals. There's a thin line between being a womanizer and being a jerk, which one was Alan, does it matter you bastard? Leave my waifu alone. Idiots. At this point, you must accept that every waifu in his path will end up obsessed with him, or do any of you believe you can win a girl's attention against him, no. Not. If I were Alan, I'd even get my mother. Leaves the chat dramatically. F for all the singles Alan will leave behind. Equals equals equals. Alan sighed in relief as he looked at Zaytna's face of frustration and shame. Unexpectedly, she opened her eyes and stopped struggling. Her gaze became confused, then calm with a hint of concern, and finally, she sighed before nodding. Alan smiled, and a contract manifested beside him. Yes, Alan used one of the most well-known characteristics of demons, contracts. A demon fulfills the requirements of that contract in exchange for something. Alan smiled at this. Don't make that face, I won't ask for your soul or anything like that. Alan did not fear Zaytna, but like Superman in this universe, she was not someone he could easily defeat. Alan had Darkseid and his minions, as well as who knows how many monsters could appear. It wasn't the time to waste abilities fighting against an overpowered waifu. Zaytna closed her eyes as the contents of the contract appeared in her mind. Alan didn't ask for her life, her freedom, or her soul. He didn't ask for anything absurd, but depending on Zaytna, this could be uncomfortable. I accept, her voice reached Alan's mind. It was unexpected that Zaytna didn't hesitate to shorten the terms and benefits of the contract. Alan released Zaytna's face, and she floated a few steps back. There was a certain degree of hostility in her gaze, but there was something else, curiosity. You're not a demon, are you Zaytna said frustrated. No, I'm a supervillain. Alan responded with pride. Well, now what? Zaytna opened a door behind her and crossed it. Alan remained silent for a moment and then entered too. On the other side, Alan stood in front of a huge castle. Equals equals equals. Ruby, Shadow Crest, the home of the beautiful Zaytna. Did you ask her to be your wife or something Gwen? Unfortunately, if there's one thing Alan doesn't need, it's making contracts to get women. Look, he already got her to take him to her house. Natasha. Ha. Huh. Now a mage. What's next, a goddess Hestia, pfff what are you saying that won't happen? Athena, no one's pointing at you. Hestia, ugh. Aphrodite, just admit you like her. Hestia, shut up, bitch. Aphrodite, when it comes to Athena, you don't respond, a despicable dwarf. Hestia, that's because I respect her, unlike you, sick pervert. Aphrodite, say what you want, but with that attitude, men won't like you. Chapter 112, The Womanizer Will Be Killed When the Camera Focuses on Wonder Woman's Hand The Amazon princess's room is quite modest despite everything, it is made of white marble, giving it a sense of royalty as well as something made in ancient Greece. However, it lacked many pieces of furniture, nevertheless, it had a wardrobe that housed both the princess's casual clothes, consisting mostly of white togas, and also had three armors specifically designed for her. 
Hmm. Most notably, in the center of the room, there was a bed with a veil covering one of the strongest and most beautiful women in the world, Diana of Themyscira. Dot Allen. The mighty Wonder Woman lay peacefully like a goddess in her sleep. Her ethereal figure seemed to emanate its own light, illuminating the room with her incomparable beauty. A gentle breeze entered through the partially open window, caressing her dark, night-like hair and whispering in her ear that a new day had arrived. Upon waking up, her eyes, radiant as the sun and blue as the sky, shone with happiness and affection. That day, the love of her life returned and this certainty filled her heart with joy and anticipation. At that moment, Diana seemed more than a woman, she was a goddess of the dawn, ready to welcome her beloved with open arms and a soul brimming with love. Diana smiled as she lay there, looking towards the window and blocking the incoming sunlight with her hand, not that it bothered her, but having light in her eyes prevented her from visualizing Alan's face. Diana smiled as she remembered that it was a day like that they had met. Diana's POV. You're a naive girl who doesn't know how dangerous love can be. Those are the words my mother and aunt used to tell me. However, contrary to everyone's beliefs, I wasn't a naive girl, even though I admit that I fell in love almost at first sight with him. From the moment I met him, I felt something for him, something that was love. I don't know why that's wrong and should be frowned upon. I can say that my feelings are real. It's just that my heart started beating earlier than most. End of POV. Diana closed her eyes still in bed, not wanting to get up yet. 300 years had passed, but now, it didn't feel like that much because Alan had been with her for a long time. Diana thought of him and couldn't help but remember so many things. 300 years ago Diana did not have the maturity or knowledge to understand her mother and her decisions. She didn't know the harsh reality of Ares and Hercules's actions, she simply saw her mother hating men for being men. Why can't we interact with the outside world, mother? Themyscira is closed to the outside and no man may set foot here, period. Why? You are too naive Diana. Diana was curious, she had been curious about the outside world for a long time. One day, while walking through Themyscira after fighting with her mother, she suddenly found herself in the sky with Alan, she followed him and ended up getting involved with him. Is this a man I imagined it as a combination of a savage and a beast, no, Diana, you can't judge someone by their appearance. Diana's thoughts were a mix of confusion and curiosity, but due to her laws, she had to be hostile towards Alan. Diana experienced firsthand a common man, not an extremely kind one, not an extremely violent one, just a guy with common sense, with a peculiar personality. Everything was going well between them, but Diana realized a terrifying truth. I know, even if I haven't fought with him, I know from my soul that he is very powerful. Why did he let himself be captured by me? Diana was not deceived by Alan from the beginning, she knew about his strength, yet she was puzzled to see him allowing himself to be captured. Diana thought it was a trap but immediately dismissed that possibility his behavior is simply pleasant and a bit strange compared to what I'm used to. Diana was confused seeing this creature called a man, it was very strange how comfortable she felt with Alan. It was a unique feeling that she hadn't experienced with her sisters. In Diana's eyes, Alan was simply incomprehensible. Despite being strong, he was quite harmless, and that was something that puzzled the girl from the warrior village. The Amazons are strong, that's why they can live autonomously without the intervention of the gods. Among the Amazons, there are hierarchies, but strength also means a lot. She is not respected just because she is the princess, she is respected for being the princess and being strong. A man as strong as a god, as harmless as a horse. Of course, Alan would be annoyed if he heard that, he wasn't harmless, but he had no reason to be dangerous against Diana or any Amazon. Like most people, Alan didn't have a heart that was purely white or black but rather gray. He was a person with both good and bad points, although it was also true that his good points were very good and the bad ones weren't so bad. After capturing Alan, Diana turned to look at him several times, stunned by his clear, sky-like eyes, his gaze free of any ill intent, his shining hair, his smile that seemed to say that he would soon make a joke or mock someone, and the warmth of his presence. Alan was someone few would hate to have around, but at the same time, there was an imposing pressure beneath that was capable of suffocating her. I will lose. 
Diana was surprised by her thoughts, just thinking about defeating him seemed like a bad joke. However, what surprised Diana the most was that she wasn't afraid of him. There was no frustration in her thoughts, no dislike in her heart for that fact. She didn't need to fight Alan to know she would lose. Is this a man? In Diana's blue eyes and immaculate soul, the figure of Alan was imprinted, now, for her, the mysterious entity called a man had a face. She hadn't seen anyone like him before, not even her sisters could have those kinds of eyes. After all, a warrior village is ready for war and massacre at any moment. Alan smiled in her direction. Miss, if you keep looking at me like that, I'll have to charge you, haha, he said with a mischievous look. Diana became nervous as her heart beat faster. What's happening is this a mental attack or something? Alan laughed at her reaction, and this made Diana feel annoyed, but at the same time, there was another feeling in her chest, a sweet one. An inevitable fact that cannot be denied is the relationship between man and woman. Diana accepted Alan as a man, and at the same time, something within her awakened. There was nothing wrong with it, it was a very natural feeling. However, she was too young to know how to control her emotions. What's happening to me she thought, her face turning red. Diana couldn't understand how much this discovery would affect her. Her heart was young, and like a flower that had never been exposed to light, it was captivated by this feeling. But. Why is he making that face Diana felt afraid seeing Alan's reaction to her changes. At that moment, Alan realized what had happened in Diana's heart, and his reaction brought another feeling to Diana, confusion, fear, and pain. Why Diana asked in her heart without getting an answer. She unconsciously identified Alan's reaction as the rejection of her feelings that she didn't even understand. Diana was shattered without knowing why, in a second, she went from happiness to heartbreaking sadness. Alan took her hand and didn't let her sink. He sat with her and patiently explained to her what that feeling was, what love was. Love. Diana was like a child learning what she shouldn't know so soon in her life. But she wasn't foolish, with every word and phrase from Alan, her heart took another step towards maturity. I see. Diana was relieved, he hadn't rejected her, he simply felt guilty for what had happened. Diana laughed with a sweet feeling inside her. From your perspective, you're a bad man deceiving an innocent maiden. Hee <laughs> hee, how silly. You're not responsible for my feelings, I was the one who fell in love with you. Diana smiled, a warm and strangely mature smile as she grabbed Alan's hand. She understood the responsibility that love entails, love easily deceives, easily hurts, easily destroys a person, and easily changes, but love is something wonderful, something unimaginable. It's very beautiful. I don't regret feeling this. Diana looked at Alan once more as her heart accepted the changes, and then she experienced the words spoken by Alan, love is tested every minute. Diana felt her heart tighten as she saw her Amazon sisters appear to enforce the Amazon law, no men in Themysira. Diana felt confused and very indecisive. She had to obey the laws because they weren't just laws, they were made to protect her sisters. Could she weigh her first love against the lives of her sisters I can't. Diana refused to decide with all her heart, it was a decision as cruel as choosing between the lives of her parents or her children. Diana simply couldn't think and went with the flow without acting in favor of either side. She suffered, she felt a lot of pain, but when she reached Alan, she realized why Alan had said he wasn't a good match. Diana found her rival, the redhead Artemis, in Alan's arms, while she agonized with worry, Alan was conquering women. That bastard. She was upset, she was furious, and she felt betrayed, even if they weren't a couple, even if they were lovers, she felt abandoned. Then she simply let anger control her. Just when everything seemed crazy, Hercules and Ares appeared. What Diana stopped for a moment and saw the gods men, she felt disgusted. She had never felt so disgusted by being seen, she had never felt disgusted by someone's eyes. Diana learned about another kind of man, she also witnessed the intense hatred her mother and older sisters exuded toward them, the slimy and unpleasant sensation of being seen by Hercules as his own, and the chilling sensation of being seen as an object by Ares. This made Diana feel an endless amount of hatred towards Ares and Hercules, she couldn't imagine what Ares and Hercules had done to her mother and sisters for them to hate them so much. 
Diana understood why her mother hated men. Is this a man? No. They are beasts. Diana prepared to die if necessary, she would never let her mother fall into their hands. As her mind prepared, she saw a figure in front of Hercules, he was shorter than the god, but strangely, his presence was even greater than Hercules, the ancient hero, the god. Alan Diana was stunned to realize Alan was among the Amazons and gods as if he were protecting her sisters. Nobody's perfect, that was a phrase Alan had said. She remembered he said he wasn't a saint or a kind being, yet Diana felt that compared to those scoundrels, he was a thousand times or a million times better. Diana realized that what Alan said was true, she lacked a lot of knowledge and experience. Many people could easily affect her emotions and mood. Wait. She was moved that Alan was willing to risk himself for her and her sisters, but at the same time, an unimaginable concern came to her heart. Alan. Diana stepped forward before she realized her body moved to help him, but the only person who could stop her spoke, it wasn't her aunt, whom she respected with all her heart, it wasn't her sisters for whom she was willing to give her life, it was her mother, the woman who had protected her all her life and the woman who had suffered the most because of Ares and Hercules. Could Diana simply turn her back on Hippolyta and go to the side of a man Diana was paralyzed because she was faced with another impossible decision. Diana couldn't imagine her mother's pain if she abandoned her for Alan, yet at the same time, Diana couldn't bear to see Alan die, she felt she would be shattered for eternity if she did. No. Diana's heart trembled as she saw Hercules release a murderous intent while mocking Alan. What? Fortunately, she didn't have to make any decision, Hercules was almost instantly killed by Alan. Alan's figure was burned into her soul once again, she knew he was strong, but she was still naive. Alan was a monster, an unimaginable one, and yet he was so kind to protect her. She couldn't understand, how can there be such different men this, taking into account that the women of Themyscira and their goddesses in general do not seek conflicts among themselves. There are indeed Amazons of all types, proud, aggressive, kind, noble, and even peculiar, but she can't imagine one of them leading a revolution to take over the throne of Themyscira. Diana will never forget Alan's back as he stood in front of Hercules. The back of the man she fell in love with for eternity. After that, Diana followed her mother to kill Ares. She saw the face of the god Ares and she felt contempt and disgust, that day she met a real man and this beast was not. Leaving Themyscira and seeing the world, she realized that most men were not like Ares and Hercules, but she also laughed when she realized there were no men like Alan, for better or for worse. In a way, Alan was a weirdo even for people from the outside. This helped her understand more about the man she had fallen in love with. Diana got up as the sheet slipped off her body, which epitomized beauty and power. She walked to her window, today was the day Alan returned, and it was her last temporal jump. She smiled warmly as she held a pendant around her neck. A series of memories flooded her mind, this time from the 300 years that followed. Some were funny, others embarrassing, but all invaluable. Diana had seen many romances in the modern world, but she could proudly say that even though her man was a womanizer, he was capable of giving unforgettable and everlasting love to every woman he chose to love. Diana smiled, put on her armor, and prepared to leave. She wouldn't greet Alan in Themyscira but would wait for him in the outside world. Come to me, my beloved, and fulfill your promise. In Diana's hand, a beautiful ring could be seen sparkling in the sunlight. Chapter 113, Sexy Zaytna tries to play a prank on Alan. It backfires. Shadow Crest is the incredible castle of Zaytna Zaytra in the DC universe. This residence is located in a pocket dimension on the outskirts of Gotham City. This place harbors some of the most amazing mysteries and objects in the DC world. Alan smiled at Zaytna's suspicious look as he admired her castle, although due to the contract, Alan cannot harm her directly or indirectly, and vice versa, she cannot trust him. Zaytna still had her wand in her hand as she looked at Alan suspiciously. Are you planning to steal, use, or search for something here? Another obligation of the contract between them is that Alan cannot lie to Zaytna, but he can choose not to answer her questions. No, although I am curious about some things and would like to visit the place called the Relic Room. Zaytna was surprised that Alan knew about that place, however, through her magic and the contract, 
she confirmed that there were no lies. Alan simply has a curiosity about that place, which is a space dedicated to housing magical artifacts and relics of great power within Shadow Crest. No, the contract makes us temporary allies, but I won't trust you, Zaytna expressed with a calm look. Understandable, Alan replied, simply shrugging. There might be a great treasure in this place, but Alan has a thousand chests, his systems shop, and the ability to create incredible objects with fragments. So, his interest in the relic room is superficial. Zaytna was unable to discern what kind of person Alan Walker was. The contract they made was simple, and although she agreed under threat, Alan was very fair. Zaytna gets his help, she will be able to summon him if she needs him at any time, although the help Alan provides depends on the payment Zaytna is willing to make. She, on her part, would shelter Alan and help him cover his essential needs, but limiting it to what she considers acceptable. So, in principle, Alan couldn't trick her into giving him a massage in the bath. However, there is a trap made by Alan's perverted heart, and that is if Zaytna considers bathing with Alan acceptable in her mind and heart, she will have to do it. Cautiously, Zaytna led Alan through the dark and mysterious corridors of the mansion, showing him each of the special places she guarded so carefully. However, when they reached the hidden library, Zaytna stopped Alan in his tracks. I can't let you in here, she said firmly, her penetrating gaze searching for any hint of malice in Alan's eyes. This knowledge is dangerous, and not everyone is prepared to face it. What kind of sightseeing tour is this I demand a refund, sister? Alan said with dissatisfaction. However, that didn't last long because a mischievous smile appeared on Alan's face. I'll accept a shoulder massage in exchange. I. Zaytna was about to refuse, but due to the contract, she couldn't lie. Inside, she considered a shoulder massage an acceptable request. Zaytna looked at Alan with annoyance as she realized his trick. You're a cunning bastard, but it takes two to play this game. Zaytna smiled with amusement and snapped her fingers, and out of nowhere, a chair appeared in the hallway. Alan sat down without hesitation, and Zaytna stood behind him, gently massaging Alan's shoulders, but he could barely feel it. Zaytna pulled Alan's head back so he could see her, this was a suggestive position, but far from finding a beauty about to kiss him, Alan saw the mockery of a cunning woman. What's wrong, disappointed, said the beautiful woman, as a mischievous smile appeared on her face, she is Zaytna Zaytara, accustomed and trained to face liars, cheaters, and demon scammers. She could see that Alan's trick is very ambiguous and can be taken advantage of by both sides. Alan asked her for a massage, and she didn't consider it excessive, so she was forced to do it. But, since Alan couldn't specify anything, she could give him the bare minimum, for example, a massage so weak that it barely counted as one. As I expected, you're very astute. Alan smiled like a con artist. However, I need you to look me in the eyes in this position, of course, only while the massage lasts. Zaytna didn't understand the strange request, but since it wasn't out of the ordinary, she did it. She thought he would do something or come up with some trick, but that wasn't the case, Alan remained silent, looking upwards, and Zaytna's blue eyes showed a sign of confusion. She continued with her massage, staring at Alan, but suddenly Zaytna was confused to see that Alan was closing his eyes without saying anything. You are good. Ha Alan let out a stress-laden breath, and a smile spread across his face as he relaxed slightly. Being me is stressful, you know. I get involved in so many absurd things haha. Ha. Said Alan as if he were complaining about his life, but they were wrong, all his problems are stressful, but this life was something Alan enjoyed doing. What do you mean Zaytna asked, increasing the strength of her message, not out of enjoyment but to get more information from Alan. She was very curious to see Alan smiling. Alan sighed a little louder as he felt Zaytna's delicate fingers running over his shoulders. Zaytna was paralyzed for a moment, due to her caution towards him, she hadn't paid enough attention to Alan's appearance. He was a very handsome man, almost unrealistically so. Zaytna believes that if God had created man with his hands, he'd taken a year to make Alan. Equals equals equals. Aphrodite, A-H-H who do I have to kill to take her place Blackheart? Hestia. Athena, he's a very pleasant man to look at, indeed. Artemis, Athena equals equals equals. 
she touched Alan's cheek unconsciously. She was not a woman who valued a person's physical appearance to measure their worth, but she admits that Alan is very unfair. Alan opened his eyes a little, looking at Zaytana. It's nothing, I'm just talking to myself. Zaytana realized her actions and wanted to withdraw, but her hand was grabbed by Alan. Miss, I'll take my payment. When Alan makes a request, Zaytana holds the power, she decides how and when to fulfill it and to what extent. However, when Zaytana gets something from Alan without negotiating payment, whether she summons him in a life or death situation and Alan has to fight unexpectedly, Alan has the right to demand something in return of equal value, without her being able to refuse. This might seem dangerous to others, but for Zaytana, it wasn't a problem because she is intelligent and cunning, or that's why she accepted. You touched my cheek without permission. That allows me to touch you without permission, Alan's smile was that of a child who got his way. Zaytana felt chills, embarrassment, and annoyance at hearing that he would touch her. She might think he's handsome, but that doesn't mean she'll feel comfortable being taken advantage of by him. Zaytana gritted her teeth, but she couldn't refuse, she had acted of her own free will without asking permission. It might not seem like a big deal, but let's reverse it and have Alan touch Zaytana without permission, at the very least, he'd be a bastard. Zaytana took a deep breath as her face turned pale, she mentally prepared herself. Zaytana expected Alan to touch her breasts or something, but it was nothing of the sort. Zaytana looked incredulously as Alan lightly bit her finger while looking at her mockingly. Equals equals equals. MJHC, that's silly. He asked if I'll do the same if he asks. Gwen HC, well, this time it was Zaytana's fault, she got too comfortable with that womanizer. Natasha HC, what happened to my adorable Alan he used to be so cute and shy, and now he seems like a seductive monster. Not that I mind, I like both Alans. Rogue, I had already thought about it, but what kind of relationship do you guys have with Alan you seem unnaturally close. Gwen HC. MJHC. Natasha HC. Equals equals equals. Are you disappointed Alan said, laughing with a smirk. Zaytana felt ashamed of being humiliated by her own words, she looked at her neckline and clothes, wondering why Alan hadn't taken advantage of the situation. No matter, perhaps she doesn't like this, but she keeps her promises. Why haven't you done anything to me Zaytana asked, with a slight blush, touching Alan's tongue. He laughed and let go of Zaytana's hand. I have my principles, if you haven't done anything to me, there's no need for me to punish you in that way. Unless you ask me to, he he. Shut up. Zaytana stepped back as she breathed harder than usual. What a dangerous man. In more ways than one. She wiped her hand on her clothes, at the same time taking deep breaths to calm her heart, which was beating slightly faster. Let's go, said Zaytana without looking at Alan as she walked to another location. What are you doing I told you not to enter the library? Zaytana called Alan from a distance. Alan glanced for a moment at the entrance of the mysterious place that hides the secrets of the DC magical world, however, it was not gentlemanly to enter where permission was not given. Alan thought that despite being a shameless jerk, Zaytana could feel that he yearned to explore beyond those closed doors, but he didn't, she thought that at least Alan would respect her within the rules. They continued their tour, and when they arrived at the Enchanted Garden. This is the Enchanted Garden, said Zaytana. It's a lush garden surrounded by magic that contains mystical plants and magical creatures. Oh, can I enter here Alan asked with a half smile. Zaytana adjusted her top hat and smiled mischievously. At your own risk, my dear. She said as she walked. Alan appreciated the view of her ample bosom and her beautiful legs adorned with black fishnet stockings. Zaytana paused for a moment and looked back with a flirtatious smile, what's the matter, are you afraid? But this was a trap because she simply wanted to trick Alan into following her to a place where dangerous creatures are, and she would take advantage of them to play a prank on Alan. You have a beautiful bakery, miss, Alan replied to the fake flirtation with force. Zaytana almost stumbled at the shameless compliment. This bastard she bit her lip in frustration but didn't argue, instead, she advanced into the garden. As Zaytana and Alan explored the enchanted garden, they found themselves surrounded by lush vegetation and mystical creatures of all shapes and sizes. Among the twisted trees and bright flowers, beings of your glided and fluttered gracefully, 
emitting flashes of magic with every movement. In a secluded corner of the garden, Zaitna pointed to a majestic winged creature known as a hippogriff, whose sharp claws and strong beak were used to instill fear in the hearts of intruders. However, when Alan approached with curiosity, the hippogriff extended its neck gently, allowing Alan to stroke its feathers delicately. Equals equals equals. When H.C., you're supposed to bow to show respect, aren't you what the hell, Alan, let me go with you right now. One of the things that most affected Alan's existence was the change in the people around him. It had already been mentioned that Gwen acquired a fondness for dodging Harry Potter thanks to Alan, so when she saw a hippogriff, she went crazy. Alan smiled ironically, this hippogriff wasn't from the world of Harry Potter, and perhaps it doesn't work the same way. Don't worry, Gwen, I'll bring you to ride it later. Alan sent a private message to Gwen. While the onlookers were captivated by such a noble and beautiful creature, Zaitna had her mouth slightly open with astonishment at the hippogriff's peaceful reaction. Why, she expected the hippogriff to attack Alan upon sensing his demonic or evil power, instead, it acted as docile and sociable as a pet. She herself struggled to get this proud animal to let her stroke it. Zaitna led Alan to the moon dragons, whose scales gleamed with the silver light of the night. These dragons, like all dragons, were proud, aggressive, and very dangerous. What the hell? Zaitna and the onlookers saw the fearsome dragon lying down for Alan to mount it, this astonished Alan himself because he didn't understand why, however, he would not refuse to ride a dragon, it was a unique experience. Equals equals equals. Nikki, Noah. Captain, I want to do it. Nikki was a young woman who always dreamed of seeing magical creatures, for her, this was a thousand times more amazing than a superhero. Ruby, Tisk, what's so good about dragons, phoenixes are better. Dragons are just giant lizards, and a phoenix is majestic. Ruby seemed extremely jealous at seeing Alan near dragons. As Alan interacted with each of these creatures, Zaitna watched in amazement, and disbelief at how they responded confidently and calmly to his presence. Even the fiercest and most fearsome beasts seemed to transform into docile and curious beings at his touch. What kind of demon is this? Zaitna clearly remembered seeing Alan use that vicious and evil power, but now there was no trace of it. I don't want to interrupt your introspection, but can you help me Alan said, somewhat disheartened. Zaitna turned only to see Alan being carried by fairies an army of small fairies was kidnapping Alan, lifting him in the air while holding onto his clothes. Who are you? A supervillain. Alan replied confidently and with a serious look, however, he was still being kidnapped by fairies, so he had the threat level of a cat at the moment. After freeing Alan from the fairies, Zaitna frowned and continued to guide Alan through the garden, encountering other legendary creatures such as unicorns, whose gleaming horns used to be symbols of purity and power. Zaitna smiled maliciously, even though Alan could handle everything else, unicorns only accepted virgin maidens. Otherwise, they would attack or flee. Zaitna called the unicorn, which approached her. Zaitna looked at Alan with a slight smile. She would take out her frustration using this unicorn, the unicorn sensed Zaitna's bad intentions and neighed. Zaitna immediately put on a look of apology. I'm sorry, don't worry. It's very pretty, Alan said as he stroked the unicorn's head next to Zaitna. Equals equals equals. Jack, crap. Hestia, that's impossible. Gwen, you've got to be kidding me. No one, not even Alan's girlfriends, could accept this, it was simply absurd that Alan could touch a unicorn. Equals equals equals. Zaitna didn't even realize what had happened and continued to pet the unicorn with Alan, it's sad, but she might be the last of her kind, I've done everything in my power to take care of her, but I feel sad to see her so alone. Alan felt sorry to hear that, it's a reality that times change, and the era where these beautiful invaluable creatures could roam freely had ended. I'm sorry, little girl. Alan said as the female unicorn cut off his head. Zaitna laughed at this. She's 300 years old, she's not a little girl. Huh. Oh so you're a lady. My apologies, my lady, Alan smiled mischievously and earned a lick on the cheek. Hey, calm down, I'm married. Well. Not really, but I could be. Zaitna's mind short-circuited. The minds of all the spectators were short-circuited. 
Sexy Zaytna tries to play a prank on Alan. It backfires. Chapter 114, Zaytna falls into the demon's embrace. Alan walked in a good mood after he visited the enchanted garden. Although he had witnessed many fantastic things, including superheroes, aliens, and gods, mythological creatures remained something that only existed in fantasy stories, for a moment, he felt like he was in the Lord of the Rings. Alan felt that he had fulfilled his curiosity to see Shadow Crest just by seeing dragons, a hippogriff, a unicorn. And although a group of fairies was quite insistent, Alan promised to visit them from time to time with Zaytna's permission. She agreed to let him return. However, Zaytna didn't know that Alan, or rather Alan's system, could create a door in places he had already visited, regardless of whether they had a magical barrier protecting them. While it would be rude to enter without telling Zaytna, Alan is a villain in DC, so he can take the liberty of doing these bad things and bring his girlfriends to visit the place. Of course, Nikki isn't his girlfriend, but she's been good, so bringing her to visit isn't too bad. She'll probably faint more than once from excitement, but that's okay. Zaytna looked at Alan wearily as they left the enchanted garden and headed elsewhere. She realized she couldn't easily play a prank on him, so she simply gave in to it. Alan smiled at Zaytna's sidelong glance. I know you want to ask, but you know the rules. Zaytna didn't hide and returned Alan's gaze. Yes, why can you? Zaytna trailed off, remembering their contract. Both of them are under contract, which means even the simplest exchange between them involves a price, including information. Zaytna was tempted but decided not to ask, surprising Alan. Zaytna looked ahead with a small smile drawn on her face. You underestimate me, demon. I have my ways the woman thought cunningly as they reached a new room. This is the Hall of Shadows, Zaytna said as she adjusted her hair and made her top hat disappear. It's a place where you can study and manipulate dark arts and shadow magic. Can I enter Alan asked curiously. Don't get me wrong, I'm just curious. Alan made it clear that he only wanted refuge and to get to know Shadow Crest, he had no intention of stealing anything from Zaytna. Zaytna laughed, lightly covering her mouth with her hand. It depends, can you pay the price she said mischievously, then she turned to face the closed door, checking the seal. I'll give you a discount if you want. Alan noticed how Zaytna's bosom stood out as she leaned forward. This was clearly on purpose, perhaps to distract Alan and later commit him to pay a high price. Alan enjoyed the view, but something at this level wasn't enough to lure him into the trap. He simply shrugged. I'm not desperate, I'd rather wait for you to invite me once our trust grows, Alan winked at Zaytna. Zaytna narrowed her eyes and frowned. We might end up enemies by tomorrow, she said dryly, crossing her arms and straightening up. You might be approved by unicorns and fairies, but it could all be a lie under a powerful deceit spell. Or some relic. Zaytna wouldn't think she knows everything about the universe, perhaps there is an artifact, object, spell, or power capable of deceiving even a unicorn. If so, not only would Zaytna increase her level of caution with Alan, but she would also be disappointed. Wait, me, disappointed why Zaytna realized that subconsciously she wanted Alan to be honest and not a deception. Zaytna shook her head, dismissing useless thoughts, and headed to another place. Alan, unaware of Zaytna's dilemma, followed her with a half-evil smile. He would never complain about walking behind her because looking at her from behind is a reward in itself. Don't get it wrong, Alan isn't a desperate pervert, but understand that seeing a woman dressed like that is very stimulating for a cultured gentleman. Zaytna led Alan to the arcane cauldron, a real alchemist's cauldron used to perform powerful rituals and spells. Zaytna leaned against a wall and let Alan see the cauldron. She felt strange seeing Alan's behavior, it seemed like Alan had no contact with the magical world until now. That doesn't make sense considering his power and handling of magic thought Zaytna, trying to understand what kind of existence Alan was. Go ahead, just don't break anything, Zaytna said calmly. Yes, mom. Alan approached the mystical pot, it had a mysterious aura and a heavy air, even if it was inactive, this aura recounted the many times it had been used in the past and the incredible things done here. Zaytna became increasingly confused by the contradictions of the entity in front of her, so she prepared to carry out her plan. 
Alan quickly got bored because Satana didn't let him throw some mystical plants into the cauldron and see what would happen. You know I have to do it. Alan said, his hand over the cauldron. I won't let you burn down my house. Zaytana grabbed Alan's hand firmly. Let go of that. Zaytana dragged Alan to another place, literally, she took him by the hand and pulled him to another place. Alan didn't complain about this, but the spectators were upset. Equals equals equals. Motherver. That should be me. Why always him? In the harem's chat, there was also a reaction to the sudden intimacy. Aphrodite HC, ha. Huh. Alan, please take me, she doesn't deserve you. Maria HC, can you stop acting like a horny animal I really wonder why you haven't been banned. Athena HC, I apologize for Aphrodite's behavior. Ever since she met Alan, she's lost a bit of self-control. Hestia HC, a bit she's turned into a SL. Artemis HC, language. Hestia HC, sorry. Equals equals equals. Alan furrowed his brow, confused, as they reached a dead-end hallway, where there was only a mirror. This is the mirror of truth, a magical mirror that reveals the true nature of people and can be used to find hidden truths. This was the reason why Zaytana didn't feel pressure to find out who or what Alan was, using this mirror, everything would be revealed. She smiled as she let go of Alan's hand. This is a magical mirror. Oh, what does it do? Alan was curious why this was here and not in the relics room. Alan, for his part, did not know of this, let's remember that Alan or even his most DC fan spectators only know less than half of the DC universe. No one remembers this mirror, so Alan assumed it was from an unknown universe, knowledge that was never published in Marvel. In the chat, a heated discussion began. What the? Alan was curious, but he remained cautious. Alan shrugged, unaware of Zaytana's plan, he imagined it could be a trap or that she would trap him inside the mirror. Alan wasn't foolish and had Limitless ready to respond to whatever came, and if that failed, the system could get him out of any situation. Approaching the mirror under Zaytana's expectant gaze and the worried looks of most spectators, especially those close to him, Alan saw his reflection, unsure of what would happen. And nothing happened. Hey, your machine broke. Alan called out disappointedly to his reflection in the mirror. What Zaytna exclaimed incredulously. Alan turned to her. Was something supposed to happen he said coldly. I thought we had a deal. Alan knows Zaytna from the comics and has a deal with her in reality, but that doesn't mean he'll forgive her for trying to capture him or something, in any case, she would earn a few spanks on her peach butt. Zaytna shivered and covered her bakery, not understanding why Alan was looking at her like that. Wait. Zaytna panicked as she saw that Alan's look showed he was not at all happy with her deception. This is the mirror of truth, it reveals the true nature of whoever is reflected. Zaytna immediately disclosed. Alan was amazed to hear that and looked at the mirror, but his reflection remained unchanged. Hey, nothing's happening. Did it break? It's an ancient and very powerful object, Zaytna gritted her teeth with frustration. And does that mean it doesn't break? Alan replied sarcastically. Zaytna could only remain silent. Alan approached her and gently grabbed a lock of her hair. Cheating is wrong, miss, if you wanted to know my past, you must pay the price, Alan smiled maliciously, and Zaytna blushed. I just wanted to know a bit more about your nature. Alan put his hand on the wall, cornering Zaytna. Don't try to minimize your mistake. Alan exclaimed. A deal is a deal, it's important for sorcerers, demons, or even villains. Zaytana lowered her head, she knew she had done wrong. Fine. What do you want? Zaytana resigned herself to paying the price for this deceit, unconsciously covering her breast. Alan smiled as his feigned anger dissipated, then thought about teasing Zaytana a bit, like with Ivy, to see how far he could push her, maybe he could make her dress up as a maid. Well. I want. Equals equals equals. Gwen. Natasha. MJ. Maria. Felicia. Diana. Hestia. Ruby. Artemis. Athena. Rogue. Aphrodite. Nikki. Equals equals equals. Alan coughed at the silent looks of so many women in his chat and regretted what he was about to say as a joke, 
he almost let himself be carried away by his impulses. He had already played with Supergirl, Batgirl, Poison Ivy, and now Zatanna, maybe he should control himself a bit this time. Host, do you plan to let Zatanna go? What if I sleep with you Alan said boldly, in the end, he didn't control himself. What never? Zatanna drew her wand as she prepared to fight, she wouldn't fall into Alan's perverted claws without a fight to the death. Calm down, I didn't say we'd have sex, we'll just sleep in the same bed, Alan smirked mockingly as he brought his face closer to Zatanna's. Maybe the great female wizard Zatanna Zatara can't handle something of this level. Ugh, you jerk. I don't know what trick you used to conquer her the unicorn, but you've shown your true colors, Zatanna gritted her teeth with frustration. Fine, I accept. Alan laughed, and Zatanna sighed, they both left the place without looking back. As they left, the mirror, which had remained silent, showed some cracks across its surface. At the same time, the image of a boy under a terrifying moon appeared, with Crown Clown covering him as if to prevent the moon from seeing him. Zayton aside as she stopped in her tracks, standing in front of a portrait of a man dressed as a magician, Alan recognized this man as John Zatara, Zaytana's father. Alan said nothing because he was supposed not to know who the man was, but he felt a trace of loneliness in Zaytana's eyes. Zaytana's story begins when John Zatara, her father, and an ally of justice, meet Cinderella, a beautiful woman from the mystical Homo Magi race, Zaytana is born from their union. Shortly after Zaytana's birth, Cinderella mysteriously disappears, and she is presumed dead. As she grows into adolescence, Zaytana learns her father's illusions and secrets and starts collaborating in his shows, unaware of Zaytana's superhero past. Zaytana suspected that she too could perform real magic acts, she uttered a spell backward and managed to ignite the fireplace with her words. When she recovers from the surprise, she decides to use her new powers to find her father. I don't like seeing you so sad. Alan approached from behind and hugged Zaytana. What are you doing Zaytana said embarrassed and annoyed that he, the bastard, would take advantage of a moment of weakness to take advantage of her. Alan remained undisturbed as he looked seriously at Zaytana, this stopped her attempt to free herself from him and let him hug her, she's not foolish, every exchange between them has a price, using a couple of neurons, it's easy to see that Alan is allowing her to ask for something he can't refuse. Zaytana and Alan remained silent, Zaytana bit her lips, she disliked this situation, but at the same time, she disliked that she did not feel rejection towards him. Demons are aesthetically unpleasant beings, Alan is the complete opposite of that. However, she doesn't forget his mysterious power and the fact that she doesn't know anything about Alan. Minutes passed, and Zaytana saw that Alan didn't try to touch her beyond a simple hug. She didn't want to, she resisted, but she couldn't feel fear or rejection from being like this with Alan. She relaxed, leaning on Alan's arms. Damn it. Why? It was too comforting a sensation for her, before she realized it, she fell asleep. In her dreams, she remembered her days learning magic to put on a good show, she enjoyed her life as an illusionist, but when she described her potential as a sorceress, she decided to change her life without knowing the raw and cruel aspects of the magical world. Suffering. That awaits every sorcerer upon death, whether it's her father, friend, or acquaintance. Sorcerers dabble in dark arts and end up marking their souls, in some cases, some sell their souls to demons. Zaytana always mocked the fools who did that, and now she ended up making a deal with a demon in the same way. However, this demon is very strange. Against all logic and instinct, Zaytana fell asleep in Alan's arms, she could be killed, or he could do an incredible amount of things to her. She was aware of that, but her heart ignored her reason and made her feel a warmth she had forgotten in Alan's arms. Chapter 115, Gotham Turns Red for Dark Side Zaytana woke up an hour later while Alan remained to be her pillow, this wasn't broadcasted, now Alan was sitting on a sofa with Zaytana's head in his lap. What happened she asked, rubbing her eyes. You fell asleep. I in my arms, like a cute little girl, Alan replied and then smiled teasingly. You're very comfortable, aren't you? It's true. Zaytana got up from Alan's lap without reacting to the situation. Alan didn't expect her to act like a shy high school girl, but her silence hurt his pride as a professional pillow, okay, it was a bad joke. 
Zaydna noticed Alan's slight dissatisfaction and smiled as she leaned back into his lap. This is an exchange. I see no reason to think outside of that, demon, she said, justifying her lack of reaction. Or do you want me to embarrass myself because that will cost you? Zaydna shot him a playful look as she watched him from an intimate position. Alan caressed Zaydna's cheek without changing his expression. That's right, sorceress. This is an exchange. There's no need for feelings. Alan said with a half smile but immediately became serious. This is your reward for the hug earlier. Your father, John Zadera, is in another dimension, he exiled himself to avoid seeing you, but it wasn't by his own will. He is cursed. He looks you in the eyes, you will both die. As he finished speaking, all the objects in the room began to levitate as a large amount of aura enveloped the place. Zadena's hair began to levitate, and her eyes became shiny. Zaydna's voice was calm but hid a great deal of contained fury. The sorceress Allura, replied Alan. Zaydna's magic calmed down, and she returned to normal. Then she got up and opened a magical door to another place. Thank you. Zaydna summoned her hat and magic wand. You're allowed to come and go in this place whenever you want, find a room you like. I don't know when I'll be back, you can consider this place your home, but don't enter where we agreed. Zaydna opened a door and prepared to leave, it didn't take a genius to know she was going to look for her father. Don't forget to call if you need help. Alan said with a slight touch of concern that didn't escape Zaydna's ears. She stopped walking but didn't turn around, she simply nodded her head before disappearing. Equals equals equals. Hey, follow the waifu, it could be dangerous. Fool, you know Alan is now like her Shikigami, she can summon him whenever she wants. Something like Megami's Mehoraga, God, there are so many examples, and you mention the guy who wants to summon Mehoraga even to go to the bathroom. LMFAO. Equals equals equals. At this moment, Alan was left alone in the Shadow Crest. Alan thought he might end the live stream and bring his girlfriends to visit this place, although there was a possibility he would get punched in the face. I guess I deserve it if that's the case. Alan won't beg for forgiveness or run away from it, he must take responsibility and face the consequences of being a womanizing bastard. Host, you're unexpectedly honest. It would be very rude to run away after getting involved in their lives like that, besides. What? I can be a bastard, but I'm sincere when I love a woman. Alan's words came from the bottom of his heart. He won't justify himself, he won't try to convince others that his way of loving is right, he won't try to make them understand, he's just this kind of man with twisted common sense and a big heart. If you weren't a womanizer, that statement would sound more convincing. Maybe ha 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 Alan laughed out loud. Apocalypse, the planet of Darkseid and his main stronghold in the universe, this place is full of parademons, millions and dozens of millions hundreds of millions everywhere, but also loyal subordinates towards Darkseid inhabit here. The countdown clock was ticking. Steppenwolf advanced amidst the formed parademons, the humanoid giant was covered in golden living armor, he advanced carrying an imposing golden axe, this axe had taken countless lives and subdued entire civilizations, perhaps before Darkseid, it was common to see him kneeling, but for everyone else, Steppenwolf is a monster. The promised hour will come, and the earth will run with blood in the name of Darkseid. Said Steppenwolf as if he were praying as he advanced among the monsters. Despite how terrifying the parademons are, they don't compare to the bloodthirsty pressure left by the ancient general Steppenwolf in his wake. He has conquered countless planets for Darkseid, but this time his mission is not conquest, his mission is not the search for resources, his mission is murder, just that, the simple murder of one person, Alan Walker. For Darkseid. Steppenwolf shouted as the tens of thousands of parademons behind him did the same. Today, I will regain your favor my lord. In front of Steppenwolf, a mother box was floating, glowing as it was connecting with another on earth. On his throne, Darkseid looked through a screen at Steppenwolf about to leave. Normally, Darkseid sends scouts to place mother boxes in the most populated areas of a planet to be conquered, thus when he appears, he can deliver a harsh blow to the planet in question and end it in one fell swoop. However, this time he decided to act differently. Darkseid is very intelligent, 
he previously knew the entire capacity of planet Earth, including civilizations, weaponry, and of course powerful beings. Among them, he found several beings that would give him trouble, especially a Kryptonian there were two, but there was no comparison between them. However, someone else appeared. Perhaps it was his instinct, perhaps Darkseid saw something in Alan, perhaps he felt something. One thing is for sure, Darkseid decided not to invade even if the anti-life equation is what he desires most in the universe, the closer you are to your goals, the harder the obstacles are. Darkseid narrowed his eyes as he looked at the mother box being activated. For Darkseid, the anti-life equation is the end, by obtaining it, there would be no one to stop him, whether it's destiny or not, it was to be expected that it wouldn't be simple. First, Darkseid had to see his opponent, and for that, he had the perfect sacrifice, a very suitable piece to use. Silent at his side remained his other loyal subjects, Granny with her annoying voice let out a snort of contempt towards Steppenwolf, who treated this as a divine crusade, Mantis felt like tearing apart Steppenwolf and Alan, all who opposed Darkseid would be killed equally. Darkseid's son looks enviously at Steppenwolf, he also wants to prove his worth to his father. In the plane where the vanguard army of Parademons was, the haggard and pale Desayat approached Steppenwolf, who led thousands of Parademons lined up behind him. This is your last chance, Steppenwolf. Said the torturer with disdain in his voice. And don't think that killing a human will absolve you of your sins. Steppenwolf knew his position at this moment, once he stood on equal footing with Desayad, but now he had to endure his contempt without replying. If he were the old Steppenwolf, he would have fought to the death for such an insult, but his pride had been discarded, and now he was upon willing to die in his master's name. It doesn't matter if it takes me a thousand more planets, I will regain my lord's trust, Steppenwolf turned towards Darkseid's castle. I, Steppenwolf, swear that I will meet my lord's expectations and bring him the human's head. Desayad narrowed his eyes, understanding why Steppenwolf was still alive, thanks to his skill and power, Steppenwolf rose to the position of general, but that's why he was always dissatisfied with being just a subordinate. Darkseid crushed him both physically and spiritually, now Steppenwolf is one of the most loyal minions and is willing to die if ordered to. Unfortunately, you won't come back alive, even if you kill the human, the Kryptonian will finish you off. It was a suicide mission, Steppenwolf had no support, only one mother box would be activated, and just by seeing that out of hundreds of millions of parademons, only a couple of dozen thousand were sent, however, the demonic alien showed no fear or dislike for this, he knew Darkseid could have killed him long ago but didn't. Activate the mother box. Steppenwolf shouted. He knew he was a disposable piece, but he didn't hate his master, he planned to kill Alan, Superman, and conquer the Earth himself, he would find the equation and give it to Darkseid to earn a place beside him again. Gotham is a city more active at night than during the day, and unfortunately not due to normal care, but because of the increase in criminal activity. In a warehouse, Bane, known as one of Gotham's most dangerous villains, carries out another criminal act involving the sale of weapons. Bane is a man of great stature and imposing musculature. His body is marked by years of training and the continuous use of the venom serum. His skin, once pale and marked by scars, now shines with a greenish glow, a result of the influence of venom on his body. His face is partially hidden by a mask connected to green tubes that snake from his back to his mouth, administering the venom serum that grants him superhuman strength. Boss, I've checked the cargo, everything's ready. When one of his men called him for an illegal weapons delivery, his impatience was palpable. Good. His hoarse voice and authoritarian tone reveal his desire for immediate results. However, in one of the weapons crates, there was a second mother box, brought by a parademon from another city to Gotham. This was the box that Steppenwolf activated to appear. Was there a reason they came to Gotham? The answer is simple, Steppenwolf is desperate to show results to Darkseid and wouldn't waste time. The mother box activated and released a burst of light. After the light, a terrifying portal was created, and from there, parademons appeared, the gangsters were astonished, however, the parademons showed no mercy, and one tore the head off the nearest gangster. WTF. They're monsters. Ah. That snapped everyone out of their daze, and immediately everyone started shooting at the parademons, although without much success, 
the bullets bounced off their technological armor. Gaya! No. Help. Seeing his men being dismembered like flies, Bane showed no fear, he opened a small valve in his mask, and the venom serum began to circulate. His muscles grew enormously, veins bulging abnormally. Bane grabbed a parademon and slammed it to the ground as if it were a rag, immediately using his large boot to crush the parademon's head. What are you fools doing shoot? Bane knew it would be of little use, but at least the shots would give him space to distract them, so Bane wouldn't have to bear all the pressure. Bane is known for his mastery of hand-to-hand -hand combat, but he's also a charismatic leader and a strategist. However, his dependency on the venom serum makes him vulnerable, as his addiction can cloud his judgment and lead him to act impulsively in moments of stress. Bane grabbed a parademon by the neck and threw it into the sky, knocking down three more monsters, although they didn't die, this display of power made his subordinates regain their courage. Use the weapons. Bane shouted. At Bane's command, several of his men opened the sealed crates that appeared to carry clothes, from there, they pulled out automatic rifles and even a rocket launcher. The war cries and courage of the gangsters resonated for several blocks around, as expected, people called the police, Commissioner Gordon learned of such a scandal with military-grade weapons at the pier and immediately went with his men. However, upon arrival, there was only silence. This was supposed to be a war zone. Commissioner Gordon took less than five minutes to arrive after receiving the report, but everything was silent. The warehouse was dead, Gordon got out of his patrol car and looked at the traces of destruction, one of the warehouses had many bullet holes, and another was destroyed. Commissioner. One of the veteran officers looked at Gordon, he immediately understood that he needed to call Batman. The commissioner took out his phone, but just then, the warehouse door exploded, and Bane flew out to crash into a police car. Bane Gordon exclaimed, the imposing Bane was bruised with bleeding wounds all over his body and a deep cut in his chest, made by something very sharp. That Bane in this sorry state. Gordon drew his weapon and aimed at the warehouse. Who are? Before he had time to finish his question, someone's deep voice sounded from inside. Human, if you hadn't faced fifty parademons before me. Maybe you would have lasted longer. Reflecting the moonlight with his golden armor, Steppenwolf emerged from the warehouse, looked around for a moment, and shouted. My lord wants someone's head. Today there is no mercy. Today there is no benevolence. Steppenwolf's speech sounded like a mockery, for him, mercy is conquering your world, and benevolence is having the honor of being transformed into a parademon and dying for Darkseid. Fuck you. Bane got out of the car and stood up, his chest was bleeding, and his eyes were full of fury towards Steppenwolf. Stop the empty speeches, golden cow. Said Bane with palpable hatred. You killed all my men and attacked me like a coward. Steppenwolf sighed as he looked at Bane with pity. Bane screamed at being scorned and ran towards Steppenwolf, fearless, at the same time, his muscles swelled more as he released the venom to full capacity. Die. With a loud cry, Bane struck Steppenwolf with all his might, however, everyone was stunned to see that Bane's fist was stopped by Steppenwolf with one hand. Don't you understand Steppenwolf sharpened his yellow eyes. No matter the advantage, it wouldn't change anything. The axe in Steppenwolf's other hand moved before Bane's disbelieving gaze, unable to react. Blood flew everywhere. Fire. Gordon reacted first and ordered full fire. This monster must not get close to civilians. Humans, you don't appreciate the honor of serving Darkseid. Steppenwolf was annoyed and grabbed his axe to kill everyone, but before that, some of the spheres fell at his feet and then exploded. What do we do Batgirl looked at her father with concern, but he must remain calm and act prudently. We'll buy time. Batman jumped from the building and pulled out a strange gun with a blue tube connected to it. By time Steppenwolf's voice was loaded with mockery, amidst the smoke, he emerged unscathed and pointed his axe toward the sky. Kill everyone for Darkseid. Batman felt chills when he heard the roars of hellish creatures from the warehouse. Like a plague of locusts, thousands of parademons emerged. One of the police officers was lifted into the air, and to everyone's frightened gaze, he was split in half. This time the parademons weren't coming to kidnap people, they didn't need to hide, the order was to kill. For Darkseid. Steppenwolf murmured. Damn it. Wait, Barbara. 
Barbara couldn't bear to see the police officers die, as many were her acquaintances, some even attended her childhood birthdays. Barbara ran towards Steppenwolf, two parademons tried to stop her, but she threw a bomb at one and hit the other on the head with a yellow extendable baton. At that moment, a figure appeared beside her, carrying death in his hand. It was Steppenwolf, who raised his axe to the sky. Dark side is night and day, he is the future and the truth, he is God and the world. At that moment, Barbara knew she had been reckless, she was Batgirl but also a woman without superpowers, to make it clear, if the parademons caught her, they would tear her apart, not to mention this guy who could easily defeat Bane. Shit. Barbara saw the axe coming down towards her, feeling chills and terror. Chapter 116, The Royal Harem in D.C. Alan decided to bring Gwen, MJ, and Natasha to visit the Enchanted Garden, of course, there are more girls, but due to the visitor restriction, they come first. Host, don't worry, if they were going to leave you, they would have done it a long time ago. I'm not worried about that. Alan understood the system's words, but he has been exchanging messages with his girls. Mary Jane mainly felt jealous, as Alan had been neglecting his girlfriends for a long time and having a good time with unknown women. Gwen is dissatisfied with Alan's attitude, perhaps a little angry. Natasha simply misses him, even though for her it has only been an hour, for Alan, it has been several months. Alan bid farewell to his viewers, and for now, the live stream ended, at the same time, a white door opened in Shadow Crest. System, synchronize the time. As you command. With this, time in both worlds will pass in the same way. Alan had plenty of time to think about many things and realized important things in his life. To begin with, he had become paranoid and stressed to the point that he no longer enjoyed his life, this also affected his personality, Alan is not such a serious man, otherwise, he would not be such a content creator. Alan enjoys creating content, this type of system is made for him, but at the same time, he realized that he found it hard to relax. Although no one can blame him for the extreme danger. Alan felt envious of seeing himself like that in that recording, in that recording, he felt ridiculous but also so free, and most of all Alan realized how much he enjoyed turning off his brain and letting himself go. On the other hand, Alan had plenty of time to reflect on his life and how much it had changed. Alan's POV I stayed silent as I waited for the girls to pass through the door to this world. They are going to meet dragons, fairies, and unicorns. Uh. I don't know why, but at some point, I found myself involved in an increasingly ridiculous world. Everything that used to be limited to a screen is real now. I went from sitting down to play Pokemon with my followers in the afternoons, to facing apocalyptic monsters every two days, my whole life changed in less than two weeks. I'm sure this is just the beginning. Unexpectedly, I'm not afraid. For three months, I was in DC, I achieved this by cheating with time. Most of the time, I was in Themyscira, my life was somewhat complicated due to my relationships with the Amazons, but unexpectedly, it was more peaceful than my two weeks jumping from one apocalypse to another. It was as if the universe decided to give me a break, or was it because most of that time I wasn't in front of the cameras I don't want to think that having a system like mine leads to being in the middle of apocalyptic situations all the time. I don't know there are many things and mysteries that I don't have the answer to, but one thing I can assure you is that I needed that time to rest. Somehow, I feel like all the shit in the world is coming down on me for no reason. In the end, I'm just a normal guy whose biggest concern was inviting Gwen to the prom without being chased by half the idiots in school, who now finds himself involved with world-destroying entities. No, that would be a lie. There is something abnormal about me, and it is how ridiculously well I adapt to the situation. It doesn't make sense. It still doesn't make sense. I don't make sense. I should scream, I should run away, I should cry, I should get angry, or any other reaction to my situation would be more normal than just accepting it. I came to think that I had a very strong mentality, but is that all is that enough for you to suddenly accept facing the embodied apocalypse again and again no, but even if there's something abnormal about me, so what I'm Alan Walker. My story is a bit sad, but other than that, there's nothing special about me, my mother was a pianist, and my father was a photographer, just that, nothing special. 
I came to think that I was someone else without knowing it. But so what I'm not going to change even if I find out that I'm an alien or something, haha, <laughs> that's nonsense, I'm just a humble human. Besides, what defines a person is not what they are, but how they are. And I am me, with all my mistakes and defects, I am just me. Host, it seems that Gwen and MJ are still changing, they will take a little longer. Thank you. I don't know if I should be glad that my girlfriends are getting ready before seeing me. Maybe Gwen is putting on a karate outfit. Speaking of my system, it's strange, she's strange, I don't know if the system has a gender, but since her voice has always been feminine, albeit stoic, I treat her with that in mind. Hey, it's nothing like that. I admit I'm quite greedy, but I'm not so crazy as to seduce an incorporeal entity. Host. I could. Don't read my thoughts and don't interest me in anything, system. Okay. At this rate, my problems with women will be legendary, I already have to deal with goddesses. I sighed looking at the portal, if I'm honest, both worlds are dangerous, but I think they'll be safer in my world for now. Doomsday. World Breaker Hulk. Loki with the Destroyer. Dark Side. Shit, are both worlds dangerous? I'm not arrogant, but if it wasn't me, someone else would have died if he lived what I did under similar conditions. The system said it had been looking for a bearer for a long time, and I was the only one who met the requirements to use it. At that moment, I thought it referred to being a content creator, I mean, the system has that in its name, but thinking about it, that's not so special, there are dozens of thousands of creators just in my universe. So, what made me compatible wasn't just that, the system doesn't know, it just said that I was able to get it. My system is quite peculiar, it's not an omnipotent existence like many other fantasy systems, it's as if it grows with me while reminding me of an artificial intelligence that learns and grows from interaction, the advantage is that over time it will become an even more incredible system. But even with the system, I still can't help feeling worried, what about my world I can't say it was normal before, it never was. Since I was a child, I already knew about the existence of mutants and people with real superpowers. However, in just one week, my world was almost destroyed twice. If I hadn't received the system. If I hadn't been in that desert. What if I had been with Gwen watching a movie would World Breaker Hulk have destroyed the world, and I would have simply died and if I had been in school instead of in New Mexico, would Loki have split the earth in half with the destroyer's lightning? No, I can't be arrogant, there is someone who would have stopped World Breaker Hulk. When I was a god of destruction, I could feel that people were watching, I doubt the world would have ended without me. This shouldn't be the first time the world is in danger. As I pondered, the last camera floated in from the distance, then disappeared, stored by the system. Now that I think about it, my system is quite cruel, it's based on turning tragedy and danger into entertainment. Sure, the system told me that with its updates, I could change the system itself, perhaps make it completely different. But I won't do it, ha ha ha. Do I regret having my system? No do I regret that it's a content creation system never would I regret it. I love being a content creator, besides, I would rather have incompressible power than die impotent. There is nothing I hate about the system. But I can't say the same about the world, it just seems like the difficulty level of my world is very high. If this were a video game, it would be like playing in nightmare mode. Every second, a last boss or demon king spawns with hacks activated, and I only have one chance to win. It's very unfair. I know I'm nobody to complain about cheating, I have an absurd system. I'm back, said Wednesday in the distance. She floated closer in her doll form, traveling between my world and DC from time to time. While she's there, days pass for me, but for her, it's just minutes. Welcome back, Wednesday, I smiled at her presence, I must say I've gotten used to having a floating doll around me. Wednesday didn't say anything more, she just sat on my head. That's just how she is, she acted as she always does, but I noticed a certain concern in her gaze. Did something happen, Wednesday I asked lightly, so she wouldn't feel pressured to respond. She didn't speak immediately, instead, she leaned against my head first. It's nothing. I just thought about my parents. I like to know if they're okay. 
Lie, I know it's not a lie that she remembers her parents and wants to see them again, but it's a lie that it's bothering her that much. She's an expressionless girl, but over time, I've noticed her little habits, gestures, and feelings, and I also realize half the time when she's lying. Don't worry, if I can, I'll take you to your world at some point. Regardless of what she's hiding, that's also the truth. I've thought a lot about the dolls, their lives must be even more tragic than mine. They reincarnated without freedom, without even having their bodies. Although thinking about their personalities, I don't think they worry too much. Artoria is a goddess now, Rebecca is Rebecca, and Wednesday is like that. At least I'd like them to resolve their unfinished business in their worlds, maybe visit their families or friends. Do you think it's possible Wednesday responded, I admit it won't be easy. In theory, if you can enter another world, like now in DC, there are possibilities of entering other worlds. Wednesday leaned back on my head and held out her hands as if hugging me. I don't know, it seems like your system is designed to exist only in DC and your world what's it called ah, yes, the system said it's called Marvel. Wednesday is right, it's not that the system doesn't want to take me to another world outside of the DC universe, it's just that it can't or doesn't know how. I'm sorry. Making promises without knowing if they can be fulfilled is wrong. Don't worry. And thank you for caring. My heart pounded, it was a warm feeling to hear those words from Wednesday Adams, unexpectedly, it made me smile. We remained silent for a while as the magical atmosphere of the enchanted garden moved my clothes. Host, do you regret having me? Do you regret having me? Both, the system and Wednesday asked for something similar. Regret no need to even think about it? Never. Not for a second do I regret having a wonderful system and such a reliable doll. I smiled proudly at the world. Whether it's troublesome or dangerous, I love my life and having so many wonderful women in it. Obviously my male friends too, although to a lesser extent. End of POV. Alan could swear that Wednesday had blushed, but she quickly fled. The system, for its part, remained silent for a while after Alan's words. You look very happy said a sharp and pleasant voice. Alan stopped smiling when he saw someone enter through the door. Out of nowhere, Alan saw a fist aimed at his face, connected to a blonde girl he loves. He wondered if he should block it, but decided not to. Alan closed his eyes, expecting to be sent flying, he deserved it, or so Alan thought. And even though he didn't use his infinity, with his current resistance and Spider Gwen's punch at full power, it would only hurt a little. Hmm. However, the pain didn't reach Alan, he opened his eyes to see Gwen standing in front of him. At the same time, Alan was surrounded by Gwen's arms, she buried her face in his chest. Why didn't you hit me Alan asked as he returned the hug. Do you want me to hit you Gwen teased, puffing up her cheeks. Only if you think I deserve it, Alan replied calmly as he adjusted Gwen's hair. I decided to accept this before accepting my feelings, Gwen looked at Alan with a calm gaze and a bit of dissatisfaction. I don't regret our relationship, but don't be mean, and let me be jealous once in a while, you bastard. Alan laughed and lifted her to give her a tight hug. No, I promise I'll make you so happy that you'll get tired of me. Hey, aren't you embarrassed to say such cheesy things? Ha ha ha. I see there's a lot of love between you two, Mary Jane entered through the door, her red hair waving in the wind. I hope there's a little for me too, she said with a warm smile. Among Alan's girlfriends, she's perhaps the least jealous and more open to the idea of sharing Alan. But don't get it wrong, she's also a girl thirsty for attention and love, and she can't stand being away from Alan for too long. Alan opened his arms, and Gwen kindly gave MJ space to enter Alan's arms along with her. I missed you, MJ. Alan hugged her tenderly as he whispered lovingly. I missed you more she melted into his chest, her eyes becoming teary. It all started with the three of them. Maybe if Alan hadn't met Gwen and MJ, he would never have opened up to romantic relationships. Natasha's case is special and complicated, Alan's relationship with his aunt was as thin as a sheet of paper and as deep as an abyss. Alan wouldn't have accepted his semi-taboo feelings for Natasha if it hadn't been for Gwen and MJ opening his mind to another type of relationship. Tell me what about me Natasha said, strangely jealous, she's usually not possessive, but now she wanted a little affection too. 
Natasha came in behind the two girls but gave Gwen and MJ space, but then she got jealous and simply walked up to Alan while wearing her tight black widow's outfit. Gwen and MJ left Alan's embrace and gave Natasha room. Alan wondered why she was dressed like that, but Natasha didn't feel like talking, she wrapped her arms around his neck and kissed him. Um red heart MNN do you think you can flirt in front of me without consequences? Natasha devoured Alan's mouth and pushed her tongue in, she was like a lioness marking her territory Alan for his part would not be honored and his hands moved down towards Natasha's sexy pastry. Gwen and MJ were spitting with jealousy as they watched the couple kissing passionately and wondering how the hell a pervert like Alan could touch a unicorn. Chapter 117, Stealing a Kiss from a Superheroine in Front of Her Father in Marvel, at the end of the live stream all the media outlets were filled with Alan Walker. This time, Alan's peak viewership reached 50 million, which might seem little considering how well known he is in the world, but despite culture advancing in giant strides, it's still 2014. It's an era where streaming is just beginning. I had already explained that the development of video games, anime, comics, movies, music, technology development, and other entertainment is coordinated with our era, but most things like fashion and culture are closer to 2014. Most people prefer TV, and even radio and newspapers were more popular than social media. So most people found out about Alan Walker's actions through news and different programs. In Marvel, Alan had committed one madness after another, and it all was just yesterday. It's correct to say that the world hadn't yet fully assimilated it. However, not everyone received Alan's antics with humor. While they were controlled pranks and no one died, there's no doubt the message was received, you can't stop me. Alan had enormous power, but thanks to S.H.I.E.L.D. covering his back, Alan didn't have to worry about a paranoid politician starting a hunt against him, like with mutants. But yesterday it was shown that no one was capable of putting a stop to Alan, and this alarmed the governments of the world. Returning to the topic of the media where Alan became the main topic, one of them was on Murray Franklin's late night show, the king of comedy and one of the most influential personalities of the time. Murray walked to his desk amid applause, as usual. Today we have several guests. Murray said with a big smile, people loved him, and he knew it, the guests arrived one by one. In the end, the biggest surprise of the night was the presence of Christian Bale, the Batman from the incredible The Dark Knight trilogy. Murray warmly greeted Christian, and then they both sat down. Everything happened too fast, and nobody has had time to ask you, Chris, said Murray, preparing coffee for Christian in the middle of the interview. What do you think about Batman being real? While the DC universe known in Marvel was incomplete and many things were unknown, it was incredible to discover that everything was real. People thought it was a lie, and even now, some still do, but Alan is real, and tons of people witnessed what he's capable of. Consequently, people began to accept that DC was real. I didn't know how to feel when I found out, like everyone else, I was skeptical, but when someone as special as Young Walker testifies, you can only accept it? Christian laughed. Although I would have liked it if Batman were an alternate version of me, ha ha ha. Alan had met two Batmans, but neither was Christian Bale's, yet there might be a Batman of him in the multiverse. However, I'm not shocked, I'm just an actor who was lucky enough to play one of the most iconic fictional superheroes in history, and now that I know it's real, I consider it an honor. I see, it's true, Batman is an incredibly misunderstood hero in his world, is it okay to keep calling Batman fictional Murray looked at the audience. What do you think? No. Well, there you have it, Batman is as real as my hemorrhoids. Murray laughed, and the audience did too. Then he looked at Christian once again. The Dark Knight was simply high-quality cinema, do you plan to make more movies? There have been talks of a reboot of the DCEU universe, but I don't know. Haha <laughs> well, that's how things are in Hollywood, only the producers know what will happen next, Murray's smile disappeared as his gaze became serious. Tell me, Christian, what do you think of Walker? Christian was surprised by the sudden change of topic and stared at Murray with a question mark on his head, however, the show must go on, and he must answer. He's someone incredible and at the same time mysterious. Dangerous, didn't you mean that? Christian Bale didn't know what to say in the face of Murray's sudden change of attitude. My beloved audience, Murray stood up. 
it's embarrassing how little we talk about a topic that we should take very seriously. The production became nervous seeing that Murray wasn't following the script. While it's customary for Murray to go off script from time to time, it's the first time he did it so abruptly. Today, I witnessed collective hysteria, millions of people laughing and cheering for a possible sociopath. Murray the production didn't know what to do and just kept recording. What's wrong with us Murray frowned. Since when did the world become the playground of a young man with testosterone and elevated hormones? Look, the truth. Alan Walker, a monster capable of ending the world, a young man with drinking problems, a young man willing to act like a villain to make his audience laugh. And who spends his time flirting with women? Are we crazy Murray exploded in fury. Monsters are coming out of nightmares. And they want me to sit here and make jokes about Adele's weight. It's a fact that monsters capable of destroying the world appeared, and thanks to or because of Alan, people found out. Due to Alan's live streams, the government couldn't do what it always did, hide the truth. Why are so many people ignoring such a delicate issue don't they realize that our lives are as fragile to them as paper? Alan's fame had consequences, but even more so, his power and behavior raised alarms for governments and many people. They witnessed three beings capable of ending the world, and two of them were defeated by the same person. They're afraid, and they have reasons to be, Alan can wipe a city off the map if he wants to, the only reason there hasn't been total panic yet is that everything Alan does is broadcast. Thanks to that, people feel they have a certain connection with him. Being so openly displayed humanizes Alan. Everyone can see the kind of person Alan is, and how he acts and thinks, while he does a lot of silly things and sometimes seems irresponsible, he's not a monster. Excuse me. Christian stood up, interrupting Murray's speech. I'm sorry, but I disagree. Christian Bale is one of those who support Alan, perhaps he doesn't approve of everything Alan does, unlike Alan's fans, but Christian respects him and understands the burden Alan carries and how difficult his life is. What Murray turned as he watched his guests speak. Christian. Christian looked at the audience. While the power of young Walker is terrifying, he uses it to protect the earth, to protect all of us. Sure, the kid saved the earth, so we should forgive him for everything Murray slammed the table next to him. What if out of nowhere he turned bad what if he stopped playing a villain and became a real one? He won't. The man who once was Batman replied with a deep and steady gaze at Murray. Alan is. Peculiar, but I can assure you he won't turn into a psychopath. Nonsense. I'm a humble actor and can't decide what happens in our world, Christian placed a hand on Murray's shoulder. But I know we wouldn't be here if it weren't for him. Christian began walking towards the exit. Don't get too worked up, Murray, Christian said with a sigh. And give the kid a break, he lives with a weight on his shoulders that neither you nor I could bear for a second. Murray clenched his teeth but didn't argue further. They're different and valid points of view. Who's right and who's wrong Murray was right, people are ignoring Alan's power because he saved the earth. They think if someone like Alan can exist, there might be more, and it's better to just accept Alan's existence as an ally because, in the end, he's on their side, unlike a renegade god and an uncontrollable monster. Barbarous POV. Am I going to die? I watched as the golden axe headed towards my neck in slow motion, I had heard that when you're about to die, your brain gets overloaded with information that your body can't keep up with, and that's why everything seems very slow. Ha. Huh. Barbara, you messed up. A hero's life is brilliant, but their death isn't necessarily so, the truth is when you put on a suit and a mask to go out into the streets and face all kinds of mentally ill, psychopaths, and generally bad people who wouldn't hesitate to shoot you if they had the chance. You can't expect to have a pleasant death. I know. It's most likely that you'll end up dismembered alive, you can never let your guard down, that applies whether you have powers or not. An alien invasion I never expected it, although Bruce might have, in the end, I'm disappointing the bat family he he, I don't feel like laughing. Yesterday, I was stopping a guy who stole a purse from an old lady, and I couldn't foresee what would happen in such a short time, no, I'm just making excuses, I have the best teacher, it's just my fault, I made the most basic mistake of a hero without powers, letting myself be carried away by anger. Maybe Supergirl can get angry and just jump at her opponent, but I'm human, doing that assures me a painful death, 
I should have been more careful. Fear I don't have it, but that's because I don't have time to feel fear. The blade of the axe almost reached me. I'm sorry. What I regret the most is that this will happen in front of my father and teacher. You're pathetic, Barbara. What? That voice. I recognize it no matter how much I want to forget that voice, I recognize. Ha ha. Batman wouldn't give up so easily. Shut up. Can't you leave me alone even in my death? You're not dead yet. What I opened my eyes to see the golden axe being stopped by a hand. Good night. The whispering voice of a man came from behind me, tickling me. You. I turned to face my savior, but instead, my mouth was sealed by an unexpected kiss. I was too shocked to react, and the bastard took advantage to slip his tongue in. Hum you dot mhm. I tried to speak, but he didn't let me, my legs grew weak, and my heart began to beat as if it would explode, I felt weak and had no choice but to lean on him to avoid falling. The bastard wrapped his arm around me and pressed me selfishly against his body, I could feel his possessive instinct. When I couldn't breathe anymore, he let me go, and I rested my head on his chest, I swear it's not intentional. Walker, or whatever his name is, looked angrily at the golden armored alien. How dare you steal my antagonists? You're the human. The great extraterrestrial shouted with anger as he looked at Alan as if he had killed his parents. Do I know you? I am Steppenwolf, faithful servant of the god Darkseid. Dark Side. I was out of breath and could barely pronounce words. Damn, I have to get rid of this guy. The pervert is touching my ass while talking to the alien. Ugh, his hands are skillful. No, Barbara you can't. But it feels so good his hug, no. Bastard. Hey, don't look at me like that, I'm just taking my payment. What do you mean? Heroes save altruistically, I don't, I saved your life so I deserve something, you know. He brought his face close to me to kiss me, damn it I couldn't muster the strength to escape I will have to obey, I closed my eyes and waited for him to kiss me, not that I wanted him to kiss me. I am not an easy woman. I didn't ask for it. I was annoyed by his arrogant attitude. Oh okay. Ah uh, what? Out of nowhere, a chain wrapped around me and lifted me into the air, I looked in disbelief at Walker, who just smiled slightly at me. Don't forget, you're my superheroine, he said, looking at me intently, I won't allow you to be defeated by anyone else. Thump thump. I felt my heart pounding, he was practically telling me that I belong to him, as his antagonist of course. Damn. What a humiliation to be saved by a villain I swear I'll catch you, Walker. And a POV. Batman was about to save Barbara, but a dozen parademons got in his way, Batman had a flashback of his parents, remembering how they died without him being able to do anything. Commissioner Gordon was worse off, he ran to his daughter when he saw her in danger, but he was stopped by his subordinates, unfortunately, one of them was pierced by a parademons claw while covering him. When it seemed like the end for Batgirl, chains emerged from the ground, and at the same time, a figure appeared behind Barbara, stopping Steppenwolf's axe. Gordon was relieved, but at the same time, he was annoyed because he saw his daughter kissing her savior. He thought Barbara was already at that age, but they should choose a better place for this. At least Gordon was happy that his daughter chose a promising young man with the power to protect her when she needed it. If Batman heard Gordon's thoughts, he would curse, that bastard isn't Barbara's boyfriend, he's a shameless villain. Barbara was speechless, she was trying to catch Alan, but it was the second time she'd been in an uncomfortable situation and taken advantage of by him. Barbara was embarrassed and annoyed as she floated, wrapped in a black chain around her waist, but when she saw Alan's back, she was confused. Why did he come it seemed that Alan had appeared just to save her. Barbara blushed, she couldn't help it, Villains are selfish bastards capable of selling their mother for money or power, but Alan had appeared just to save her. Barbara wanted to bury her face in the ground and didn't want Batman or her father to see her like this, she's a superheroine, so how could she blush because of a villain Barbara had to ask, she had to know if he had come for her. So she gathered her courage and, against all logic, parted her pink lips. You. Dark side. Alan was furious. I warned you. This is my moment, 
How dare you start an invasion? Alan ground his teeth as a vein bulged on his forehead. Ha Barbara made a foolish look as she saw Alan completely ignore her and then puffed her cheeks up. Men. Chapter 118, Reign of Blood, Alan and Darkseid. Steppenwolf was furious and used his axe on Alan's neck, there were not enough words to express his anger towards Alan. How dare you speak to my master like that? Darkseid is watching right now, how can Steppenwolf allow insults to his master die, human? An axe with destructive power and strength capable of splitting a building in half struck Alan's neck. What? The axe stopped abruptly as it released a burst of air, but there was no damage to Alan's neck, he only turned his eyes towards Steppenwolf while being in a bad mood. Steppenwolf felt a chill, only his master had been able to do this. Alan looked at Steppenwolf as if he were a disgusting insect. My body and soul belong to Darkseid, no matter the enemy I face, I will never be defeated, human. Alan didn't respond to Steppenwolf's provocation, he only pointed at the golden alien with two of his fingers. Ryurin. Hanpetsu. Tchugai no Ryasei. Three months. Alan had three months where he learned to handle his innocence, but not only that. Alan stared fixedly at the monster in front of him, he was not weak. Steppenwolf was a formidable general who conquered civilization after civilization. However, he challenged the wrong opponent. There were things Alan had not yet mastered about the powers he used, that was also one of the reasons why Alan refused to change his abilities. How pathetic would it be if he changed Sukuna's and Satoru Gojo's techniques and powers without mastering them? Darkseid opened his eyes upon hearing Alan's words, he knew better than anyone the power of words in this world. After all, the anti-life equation consists of specific words aligned in a somewhat incoherent sentence. Steppenwolf felt an inexplicable fear, the ex-general tried to get away, but it was too late. The cut that cuts through the universe. Steppenwolf's POV. I am not weak, I was not weak. If I were, I would have been dead long ago, if I were weak, my lord would never allow me to continue living after betraying him. I had to prove my worth once again, that's why I'm here, that's why I live risking everything, and yet. You're here. My gaze fixed on the human in front of me, he was small and thin small in comparison to Steppenwolf, he seemed insignificant like an insect, so why 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 is my arm on the ground why am I bleeding why is my armor, which has endured weapons of mass destruction, cut like a branch why am I, Steppenwolf, kneeling before someone who is not my master impressive, you dodged by instinct, he smiled as he looked at me calmly. His words were nothing but an insult. His eyes were undisturbed, his breathing wasn't even hurried. That attack that cut off my arm was nothing to him. I, I can't allow myself to be humiliated in front of Darkseid. I got up full of anger, took my axe from the ground with my healthy arm, and attacked with all my strength. I won't forgive you. My axe hit his head squarely, but I didn't split him in half, I didn't even hurt him, he just stood still as if I had never attacked him. I guess one doesn't become a world conqueror without being strong enough. His gaze was calm, but he seemed annoyed. I saw him close his fist slowly, he will hit me, I predicted, instinctively bending my arm over my abdomen to use it as a shield. Ugh. It was in an instant, I didn't even see it, but I knew he had attacked me. Damn, I feel like my bones are crunching, with just a small blow from him, he almost broke the bones in my arm. I told you not to interfere. He grabbed me by the neck and threw me through several buildings, it's ridiculous how much strength he has. I screamed and buried my axe in the ground to stop the momentum, but at that moment, he appeared in front of me, his gaze was no longer calm, his eyes reflected annoyance and displeasure. Ayah. What happened when I could react? I was flying high in the earth's sky, was I hit I looked down only to see a terrifying sight, all my parademons, every one of them, were wrapped in black chains. My lord. Your lord is not here. I could feel it, he was behind me with his hand on my head. I forced the fastest reaction of my life to dodge death once again. In the next second, I saw a purple flash, I started to fall to the ground as I felt something was missing, one of my horns was gone, leaving me with a wound on my head. I fell to the ground very hard, feeling like some bone had broken in my body. A monster. He's a monster. Every time I face him, it's a life or death situation, 
Every time he attacks me, I lose a part of my body. I can't win. No. -o. What sacrilege it is to surrender to someone who is not my lord. How could I disrespect my god? My everything. It's all your fault. I got up in the crater, bleeding and in pain, I looked at the human with resentment from the depths of my soul. You can cut off every part of my body. You can shatter my soul. But I, Stepan Wolf, will never surrender to anyone but my lord, Dark Side. And a POV. Host. What's up? Nothing, I'm just surprised at how much you've progressed in these three months, you can use Limitless at this level without the six eyes, you're not even using the abilities. Well, Gojo Sensei and that bastard Sukuna had already taught me the method to use all their abilities, but I just couldn't do it. Alan is talented when it comes to combat but not a monstrous genius who can master everything instantly, he needs time, and although he is not even close to Gojo and Sukuna's level without using active abilities, he is not as useless without using abilities. No, to begin with, it was very strange that Alan could have such a high level of combat without proper training. The system managed to give Alan a path that would allow him to control the abilities and powers that exceeded his capacity, and those are Alan's masters. However, calling the original users of the rewards in high-level chests is something that was not in the original programming of the system, nor is it something that Alan would have created, it is entirely the system's idea to do something like that. In summary, Alan had been fighting far above his skill level. Antiope realized this, and the first thing she did was to teach Alan the basics of swordsmanship, second, Alan began to practice every technique and skill obtained from the basics, instead of just jumping into battles and fighting on instinct. Alan was calm, although he was upset with Darkseid, for the most part, he was calm. He landed on a building as he looked at the place where Steppenwolf had fallen. He knows that the dark side he finds in this universe will not be weak, rather, he will be an unimaginable monster. Alan had already come to terms with that, as he had the example of Doomsday and Superman, who are very powerful versions of themselves. Alan squinted at Steppenwolf in the crater, who was still alive. Again. Said Alan with a furrowed brow and a serious look. He had tried to finish off Steppenwolf twice, and twice the alien had survived. Steppenwolf was not weak, in stories, it is believed that villains below the main villain, in this case, Darkseid, are filler, and it's true, but it was a fact that Steppenwolf had survived the cut of the world and a point-blank purple attack. Darkseid. Huh. Alan could affirm at this moment that Steppenwolf was not weak, in fact, he had the level sufficient to kill several members of the Justice League who were careless. By confirming Steppenwolf's power, he understood what level Darkseid would have at this moment. The blades of three helicopters sounded in the air, one belonged to a TV station, as usual in DC, there are always reporters willing to die for a story. Two more belonged to the police, after each parademon was captured, and the people on this side of the city were evacuated, the police focused on the origin of the golden armored alien facing Alan. The police spotlight focused on Alan standing on a building, However, the helicopter reporters were more interested in Steppenwolf and his invasion. No. -o. Tisk Allen clicked his tongue as he watched Steppenwolf rising with a shout of anger. Even with large amounts of blood coming out of his body, Steppenwolf stood up. You can cut off every part of my body. You can shatter my soul. But I, Steppenwolf. With every word filled with fury and unwavering conviction, Steppenwolf took a step that broke the ground and made it tremble slightly. I will never surrender to anyone but my lord, Darkseid. Steppenwolf pointed his axe at Alan. I will bring glory to my lord and your head. Alan silently looked at the alien pointing the axe at him. Steppenwolf had several broken bones, was missing an arm, had a wound on his head, and was bleeding from various places. However, far from being cowed or weakened, he faced Alan with even greater determination, all for his love of Darkseid. The images of Steppenwolf were broadcast nationwide, every word, and every action was simply terrifying. People didn't know what to think about an alien invasion, Steppenwolf's devotion to Darkseid had created a subconscious fear of his lord. Superheroes were no exception, all over the world, they felt chills at the mention of Darkseid, some had visions of themselves being killed by monsters in horrible ways. Ha ha ha. While everyone was chilled, one person left. While everyone engraved the name of Darkseid, one man left. 
the cameras pointed at Alan, it was as if they were drawn to his figure. Alan's laughter was neither too loud nor too outrageous, rather, it was a disguised mockery, a laugh. Alan smiled as he looked at Steppenwolf, but his eyes were filled with coldness. Alan was upset, he had his reasons, he had worked hard to be the villain, he had worked hard to appear as a threat. However, in just a few minutes, he was relegated to a supporting actor. Alan was very annoyed. Your lord. Your god. Your everything. Alan advanced, stepping on the air, it wasn't a metaphor using limitless he could do it, Alan descended an invisible staircase step by step. Your king. Your master. Dark side. I know him. Alan said, surprising everyone. He is an incarnation of the apocalypse, he is very powerful, he conquers planets, turns their population into monsters, and repeats it over and over again. Steppenwolf stopped his movements upon hearing his master being talked about. Someone once said, it all started with God, but it all ends with Darkseid. Even if you speak well of my lord, your death is something. Bullshit. Alan interrupted Steppenwolf. It won't happen. Alan raised his voice as chains emerged from the ground to grab Steppenwolf, then his arms and torso. Ah. Driven by anger and hatred, Steppenwolf broke one chain, but two more held him. Shut up. Alan expelled his conqueror's hacky, it was so powerful that it was able to extend beyond the city limits. Red energy rays covered him as a crushing sensation filled the area. Alan had mastered Shank's conqueror's hacky, and the ability had ascended to crimson rank. Everyone felt like they were lacking air, everyone felt the need to kneel, no one interrupted again, maybe for fear or respect. Alan arrived being just a mysterious young man dressed in black with glasses who appeared out of nowhere, he said he was a villain, but after that many did not take him seriously because there are many villains and one more is no big deal, but now it was different everyone felt it, Walker, the supervillain was terrifying. The only reason the whole city didn't pass out was that Alan had perfect control of the king's hacky and prevented everyone from being harmed except for Steppenwolf. Steppenwolf's body stopped struggling, and his unwavering faith was diminished, if only for a moment. You. The alien looked horrified at Alan, he didn't understand who Alan was, but he wasn't someone he could defeat. Alan arrived in front of a chained Steppenwolf. I told you to shut up. Steppenwolf's mind went blank and his consciousness flew for a moment, but Alan prevented him from fainting. Your lord is very powerful and terrifying, isn't he? Alan pointed two fingers at Steppenwolf intending to kill him, but before he could do anything, Alan's innocence activated, and the chains holding tens of thousands of parademons in the sky tightened until they killed them all. Parademons were split in half. Parademons were crushed. Parademons were torn apart. Parademons were dismembered. Clown Crown Alan himself was speechless, his innocence had acted on its own again. The next scene was taken from a horror movie, a rain of blood and pieces of parademons fell everywhere, dyeing the whole city red. People were terrified even though they were murderous monsters, it was too bloody a scene. Alan gritted his teeth and had no choice but to go with the flow. As I was saying, your lord is very powerful, right Alan grabbed Steppenwolf's head but the true villain is me. Darkseid rose from his throne while using his Omega Vision to destroy the screen in front of him, he didn't say anything, but everyone could feel his anger. Without exception, all his subjects knelt, everyone's faces were pale before their master's anger. Walker. Darkseid said quietly, Alan had the honor of being remembered by Darkseid and the misfortune of being remembered by him. Chapter 119, Alan's Harem Devotion. Alan brought the group of girls to Shadowcrest, after a meeting between Pleasant and Sweet, Alan guided them towards the fantastic creatures. With their presence, he didn't need to worry that they would be attacked, or even if they were, the three women were strong enough to defend themselves. MJ, being a city girl, began taking selfies with the dragons. Alan apologized to them in his heart and was thankful that they didn't understand that they would end up on Twitter with five filters on top. MJ was curious about the quantity of mysterious plants here, some had strange aspects and glow. Just as Natasha was about to grab a very pretty flower, a fairy appeared and prevented her from doing so. She pulled Natasha's hand away from touching that plant. In nature, beauty is dangerous, Alan approached, walking. 
he didn't seem anxious because the protection pendants of the girls had been enhanced by the system. Now they could generate a powerful force field in dangerous situations, capable of providing various types of defense from mental, spiritual, and physical attacks, and supernatural origins. Each pendant was purple grade and cost 10 destiny fragments. Alan couldn't skimp on expenses when protecting his family. However, the main function remained the emergency teleportation. However, because Gwen and MJ face villains and criminals like Spider Gwen and Spinneret, respectively, they need to be in mortal danger for the pendant to activate, or they activate it at their own will. Thank you, little one, Alan sighed and thanked the little fairy for her help, she blushed and hid behind Natasha. It's funny how these fairies were kidnapping you recently, Natasha said, laughing. Gwen was about to come to this world and burn their forest ha ha ha. The little fairy shivered and turned blue as she watched the beautiful blonde caressing a unicorn in the distance. Fairies don't speak, but they understand many human languages. Alan brought his face close to Natasha's shoulder where the little fairy was. It's true, they haven't told me why they kidnapped me yet Alan teased the fairy. Were you looking for something from me? The fairy shook her head and turned red. Leave my savior alone, Natasha felt warmly as she used her hand to caress the fairy. However, the little one looked in shock at Natasha, who had grabbed Alan's friend. Hey, don't rush, if you do anything to the family jewels, you'll be the one to suffer. Alan shouted, feeling Natasha's hand squeezing his younger brother. Fool. Natasha said, blushing with embarrassment. She was just joking and at the same time thinking of flirting with Alan while Gwen and MJ were busy, but Alan shouted as if she were going to castrate him. Still, they can't blame him, every man gets nervous when that area is in danger. Gwen carefully stroked the beautiful unicorn, she felt it was the noblest and most beautiful creature she had ever seen. At the same time, a thought crossed her mind. She had been watching Alan breaking her common sense over and over and meeting characters that only existed in fantasy. She wondered, is the world of Harry Potter real if so, that means Voldemort is real, a great deal of annoyance came over Gwen. That despicable monster killed such a beautiful creature mercilessly just to drink its blood. The unicorn rubbed Gwen's cheek as if to reassure her. You're a very smart girl, she smiled with a sense of peace as she realized that the unicorn was capable of distinguishing human emotions. A key characteristic of these mythical creatures is that they have a high level of intelligence. Gwen looked as Wednesday sat on a tree reading a book while two fairies fanned her with leaves and two more brought her fruit. Gwen's gaze turned white, Wednesday had somehow subdued the fairies. If her world is real, then maybe all fictional worlds are real. Alan and Natasha walked towards Gwen, Alan wondered if they wanted to eat something or visit another place. The unicorn began to neigh as it stepped on the ground. Gwen tried to calm her, but to no avail, so Gwen looked at Alan for help. Perhaps she's hungry, Alan said, unaware that the unicorn was upset to see him so close to Natasha. It seems the horned pony doesn't like me, Natasha wouldn't treat the unicorn well if it didn't do the same. That's obvious, unicorns only like pure maidens, Gwen smiled with a hint of malice, showing a little jealousy. She wasn't foolish and knew she was the only one who hadn't been intimate with Alan, well, Wednesday too but she's a special case. Natasha's eyes widened she had been attacked out of nowhere. She smiled and hugged Alan's arm tighter, causing him to sink into her ample bosom. Never mind, I'd rather ride something other than a pony with a superiority complex Natasha smiled provocatively for example, my Alan. This woman. Gwen smiled stiffly, and the unicorn neighed furiously. Alan felt he should intervene, but at that moment, Mary Jane made an epic entrance by riding a dragon. She landed next to the others, looking at them with a heroic air, all she needs is a suit of armor and she will be ready to defeat the demon king. What's going on did I miss something the redhead said innocently. However, Alan thanked MJ in his heart for interrupting and avoiding a fight. I think she deserves a reward. Mary Jane blushed at Alan's gaze as if he wanted to devour her. She had been observing Alan and noticed the slight change in him after coming to this world. No. It was from that day of excesses that Alan had a slight change in his heart. I'm not afraid of you. MJ declared with a penetrating gaze as her dragon complimented with a roar. You can come and let out all your desires on me. Shut up, pervert. Gwen shouted, interrupting MJ, 
knowing her well enough that if she let her speak, she would end up saying a bunch of vulgar things. Natasha and Alan laughed at the situation, Gwen sighed, and MJ crossed her arms unsatisfied. Is this all right Gwen watched as everyone ate without worries. Well, she said she could consider this my home, Alan shrugged innocently. This is within her permission. Hmm, I don't know if she thought about bringing your girls here, Mary Jane said, leaning on the table with her elbow. Natasha approached Alan with a bottle of low-alcohol wine, wearing an apron, and poured a glass for Alan, seeming like a young wife. There's no need to think much to know that Alan isn't a single guy, he he, Natasha said, laughing at the situation. One thing is for sure, he's not happy to see his demon with his harem. Both Gwen and MJ remained silent for a moment. It was true that the relationship with Alan was strange. It couldn't be called polyamory because they had no intention of having a relationship with other men besides Alan, so it could be called a harem. Mary Jane just thought about it for a moment and shrugged before continuing to eat. She caused this situation by insisting that Alan start a relationship with Gwen and her at the same time. Natasha used her apron to clean Alan's mouth lovingly before sitting to his left. She had already accepted this relationship a long time ago. Besides being the third to appear and enter a relationship knowing that, she had no right to complain. However, the blonde was affected by the situation. Gwen Stacy hit her head on the table as she thought about how to tell her father and mother that she was part of a womanizer's harem. It's just absurd and against common sense. Gwen didn't regret her decision, she didn't regret falling in love with Alan, but she was still afraid of her father. She had been raised with love and affection, she owed everything to her parents, and she couldn't bear to see them devastated. Alan was sitting next to her and reached out, placing his hand on Gwen's trembling hand. Don't worry, it's my responsibility to make your father accept me and accept our relationship, Alan's gaze was serious and confident and brought reassurance to Gwen. Gwen blushed and was moved at the same time. However, she didn't want to cry in front of everyone, so she sighed and looked away, but her hand gripped Alan's right hand tightly, refusing to let go. This made Natasha amused by the situation and had to feed her in the mouth. Meanwhile, Mary Jane smiled like a cat that found a new toy. She wouldn't stop reminding Gwen of this moment for several weeks. The warm atmosphere among the family continued for a while until Alan abruptly stopped smiling and looked in the direction of the invasion. Alan had learned to sense Beerus key or life energy, but like with his other abilities, he was lacking in its use until recently. Alan stood up, and although he felt sorry for leaving the girls, they couldn't roam freely in this world. Who knows if someone in the sixth dimension would get angry if they found them invading their backyard although Alan had no intention of live streaming, he had the system broadcast to the girls. It was like a private live stream just for them. All the events unfolded, Alan tore apart Steppenwolf, not literally, but morally. The world was shocked. The invasion had been eradicated in an instant, and it had not been by an army or even thanks to a superhero, the savior was none other than a villain. No, after such a presentation, he deserved the title of supervillain more than many others. My lord. Steppenwolf lowered his head in despair, but not because Alan had defeated him or left him in such a sorry state. Steppenwolf felt his world crumbling when he learned that Darkseid had cut off communications. He had been abandoned. Steppenwolf was willing to die brutally, it was nothing to him as long as it was for the good of Darkseid. But falling from the grace of his lord was too big of a blow. Pathetic. Alan saw Steppenwolf's condition and sighed. Darkseid was an expert in brainwashing, they had turned a proud warrior into an extreme fanatic. Now Steppenwolf was like a puppet. Um Alan looked up at the sky. Helicopters flew low while a camera aimed at Alan. Get closer. The reporter in the helicopter seemed nervous but at the same time was pestering the pilot to get closer. Even if he didn't complain about this, it served to spread his reputation around the world, but there's a limit to recklessness. Alan muttered with a blank look. If he were a lunatic or a psychopath, that helicopter would already be underwater. My. Lord. Am I Lord. Me lo dot rd. Steppenwolf. Aye aye aye. Alan shook his head as he looked at the general who had lost his mind. Steppenwolf had succumbed to being abandoned by Darkseid, his mind was lost in hatred and hysterical madness, he had lost everything. Alan jumped backward, 
and the golden axe struck the ground, creating a rift that ran through several streets. I'll kill you. The threat, no, the oath of Steppenwolf came from the depths of hell called despair. It was incredible that Steppenwolf became even stronger than before, but that power came at a price, and it was his rationality. He had abandoned everything that made him a great warrior, including that instinct that made him survive the purple. Alan no longer intended to prolong this, and he aimed his fingers at the fallen general. Wait. Alan muttered as he felt someone approaching. There was a flash. Alan saw the gleam of the metal illuminated by the moon. Descending from the sky, the divine figure crossed at great speed, his target was Alan, but Steppenwolf was in the way. Without a hint of mercy, the metal cut the general in half. Alan, without stopping his movements, summoned Crown Saber, in its evil version, which gleamed in black and grey tones. Both clashed their swords in the middle of Gotham, a rumble ran through the entire city as the sound of metal and sparks adorned the encounter. Both opponents looked at each other for a moment. Alan smiled with gusto as he looked at his woman, Diana also smiled warmly, but her hands pressed with all their might as her sword attempted to break Crown Saber. Was it an act had Diana betrayed Alan? No. On the contrary, the woman was pleasing her man by facing him without holding back. After all, she was a superhero, and he was a supervillain, they couldn't embrace in the middle of the cameras. They both stepped back and looked at each other. Diana touched the ring on her left ring finger, then smiled tenderly at Alan as she communicated many things to him. However, love took a back seat, and Diana brought her right hand to her left bracelet. Diana. What's the matter villain, weren't you looking for a real challenge said Diana fiercely, no, said Wonder Woman with a great battle intent behind her. Alan felt a shudder but smiled all the same as he watched her face him are you serious. Diana didn't respond with words she removed a bracelet, Alan for his part used the six eyes as he smiled. They both disappeared and clashed their swords, the resulting shockwave swept through Gotham pushing the air like a category 5 hurricane, though mysteriously no buildings or people were damaged. Chapter 120, Never Piss Off Women With Superpowers The tranquility of Gotham was replaced by the clash of Wonder Woman and Walker, the resulting pressure pushing the atmosphere causing a huge shockwave, yet this did not cause serious damage. Of course, all thanks to Alan's innocence, which covered the buildings and the people who remained nearby. Unlike before, where flashy barriers were formed, now the protection of Clown Crown is almost undetectable, so few people would notice. Jim. An officer shouted upon seeing a car fall onto Commissioner James Gordon, he was close to James, so he called him by his nickname, Jim. The officer approached in panic, not knowing how he would explain to Gordon's family if James died. Don't worry, I'm fine, James said as he tried to get out from under the car. Batman landed next to James, and without saying anything, took a box from his belt, placed it under the car, and it expanded, lifting the car so James could get out. Thank you. James said. The officer was aware of the close relationship between Batman and James so he kept silent. However, it was quite surprising to see them talking, especially considering that, for the general public, Batman had been a myth until now. Batman pulled out a scanner and used it on James Gordon to check for injuries, but he was completely fine. You're all right, how is that possible Batman said with a puzzled look. Well, I'm glad to be, James replied with an uneasy look. James was already familiar with Batman's personality, so he was not offended to see him more concerned about why he was still alive than his health. I'm sorry. Batman wasn't known for apologizing, but his good relationship with James, considering him one of his few friends, was enough to make him do it. James shook his head. Don't worry, I understand. I'm also surprised to be alive. Batman was about to say something but received a call from Alfred through the earpiece in his mask. Sir, is everything all right? Alfred, what's going on? Batman responded alarmed. His communication was through his personal satellite, receiving interference was very difficult, if not impossible, by normal means. Sir, something is interfering with the communication. I have no way to support Alfred only managed to say that before the signal cut off. Batman narrowed his eyes as he looked at the sky, touched his head, and the visor embedded within his mask began to change. Temperature detector. 
Night vision. Infrared vision. Motion detector. Batman tried different methods, but it was only through changes in the light spectrum that he managed to see something. It's like being underwater, but it's imperceptible, and almost intangible, it remains in that state until it needs to stop the attack. Batman thought as he directed his attention to where the sounds of metal clashing and gusts of wind were coming from. Batman remained silent, lost in his thoughts, James didn't disturb him, he saw his daughter not far away, but he couldn't go to hug her as his secret identity would be revealed. Although I'd like to talk to Barbara and her boyfriend, it's not okay for them to practice bondage in public. That should be only in intimacy with your partner. Barbara would spew curses if she heard her dad's thoughts. Barbara opened her eyes, unable to believe she was alright after such an explosion since it occurred close to her. She looked around, there were overturned cars everywhere, the corpses of many parademons adorned the ground, yet strangely, the police officers were fine, and even the buildings didn't seem damaged. Barbara searched for her father, looking around while still suspended in the air by the chain. In the distance, Barbara saw two of the three helicopters, which had landed in the middle of the avenue. Impossible. They had been hit by the shockwave too, but far from losing control and crashing, they landed without problems. Barbara bit her lip as she concluded that it was Alan who had helped the helicopters. Wonder Woman didn't have that kind of power, and there was no one else who would do it. Besides, Alan had shown before that he didn't mind being recorded by helicopters. Did he protect everyone? The thought that crossed Barbara's mind brought up complicated feelings. For a moment, she even felt that maybe Alan wasn't a soulless monster. However, she quickly shook that thought from her head. She felt bad believing that her subconscious was looking for ways to justify Alan's actions, to see him less evil, to convince herself that Alan wasn't a villain. But what has he done? Barbara reviewed Alan's actions in her memory. For a moment, it seemed like he hadn't harmed anyone. Yes, he robbed a bank, fought Superman, threatened a city, kidnapped Supergirl, kidnapped Batgirl, and declared himself an enemy of the world. But as far as she knew, Alan simply punched Robin and Beast Boy. No. You must control yourself. He's not good, he's just a pervert. Barbara knew that Alan treated her well, more than he should, but that could be explained by the simple liking of a womanizing villain for beautiful women. Barbara believed that she had to believe that, as her heart wouldn't stop pounding since Alan stole a kiss from her. She felt that if she let Alan enter her mind even more, she would end up falling in love with him. She bit her lip to prevent tears, she convinced herself that if she weren't a beautiful woman, Alan would never have saved her. That's it, it's all an act. Damn Walker. Barbara searched for her father again and saw him talking to Batman. Barbara sighed in relief and proceeded to try to free herself, it was embarrassing to be trapped longer by Alan's power. Come on, Barbara, free yourself, people will think you like being tied up. Batgirl was embarrassed by her situation, it was the second time she had encountered Alan, and it was the second time he had practiced bondage on her, and this time, it was in front of her father. You'll pay for this, Walker. Batman approached Barbara after leaving James behind, unfortunately, James had to wait to reunite with his daughter. Need help? Hey no, I'm fine. Upon noticing Batman, Barbara began to struggle harder to free herself. Barbara had to show that she hadn't fallen under Alan's influence. Please, let me go, Barbara murmured anxiously. But as if the chain had heard her words and felt that she was no longer in danger, it slowly lowered her to the ground. She opened her eyes in disbelief. I just had to ask. Clown Crown picked up Barbara's belt full of gadgets from the ground and handed it to her. Why Barbara asked as she grabbed her belt, stunned. Of course, expecting an answer from an object is useless. Barbara pressed her lips together and released the pent-up pressure, then looked at the chain and thanked it, even though she didn't know why. Thank you. The chain shook as if nodding and, having completed its mission, disappeared. Barbara held her belt between her hands as she was filled with complicated feelings. The chain had unexpectedly been kind despite being a chain of evil. No, it's his power, so it was him. The villain who saved my life, the bastard who keeps bothering me every time he sees me, the son of a bitch who stole a kiss from me, he is the hardest villain I have ever met. But Alan's smile appeared in Barbara's mind. 
Do I like him? No. That's impossible. I just met him, he's practically a stranger. Batman silently observed Barbara's internal struggle, he didn't interrupt her. No one can force her to make a decision, it's up to her what she'll do. Batman witnessed everything, and it was more than obvious that the girl felt a certain attraction to the villain. This wasn't the first time this had happened, and Batman isn't one to judge, there has been some tension between him and Catwoman in the past, but it never resulted in anything. However, Barbara isn't Bruce, she doesn't have the maturity to deal with her feelings more appropriately. Barbara took a deep breath and looked up at the sky. Damn it! Barbara shouted as if releasing all her frustration, then she turned to Batman with a firm gaze. How do we defeat that despicable villain? Are you okay Batman asked calmly. Even though he wouldn't stop searching for a way to neutralize Alan if necessary, he wouldn't ignore the will of one of his protégés and disciples. Barbara was surprised, she was ready to be scolded or given a lecture on how wrong it was to feel attracted to a villain. She smiled bitterly. I'm sorry, Bruce. Maybe I like him. She said with a downcast look, feeling disappointed in herself. However, I'll stop him, I'll put him in jail or some prison that can contain him, I'll make sure he stops committing crimes. And maybe someday he... She couldn't finish the last part. Batman approached and put his hand on Barbara's shoulder. You can feel whatever you want, Barbara, just don't let it cloud your vision as Batgirl. Separating your feelings and thoughts into two by wearing the mask works. Believe me. Barbara was incredulous at the level of understanding Bruce showed her, but she was grateful for such a gesture. Batman, for his part, felt like he had pressured Robin, wishing he would be a copy of himself, which ultimately pushed him away. It was inevitable, but Batman is Batman, and Batgirl is Batgirl. Barbara couldn't deny that she liked Alan, but even if she did, she was a superheroine, and she wouldn't let innocence pay for his mistakes. That's why she'll stop Alan. Don't worry, I'm Batgirl. Declared the girl with a gaze full of confidence and determination. I won't let a villain outdo me. Batman nodded and then used special binoculars that captured high-speed movement. It seems like Wonder Woman can keep him at bay for now. Batman saw the exchange between Alan and Diana, narrowing his eyes. They shouldn't be long, Batman said mysteriously. Alan dodged Diana's sword by leaning back, then dropped and supported his hand on the ground. From that position, he kicked Diana, who blocked it with her sword, but the force sent her through several buildings. Diana stopped in a street, grabbed a car, and threw it through the building she came from. Alan laughed and used red to destroy the car along with the building. However, upon exiting, Alan was surprised to see a dozen cars falling on his head. Dismantle. All the cars shattered into pieces. Alan smiled as he turned to the right only to have a sword fall beside him from behind. Alan reached out to try to grab Diana's arm, but she rejected his hand with a blow. Diana stomped on the ground with enormous force, lifting the pavement of an entire street. Alan rose into the air along with the street, but he didn't let this unsettle him. He activated blue in his hand and pulled Diana towards him. As she was about to reach him, Alan summoned Crown Saber once more and coated it with Conqueror's Hacky and Armor Hacky. It was very fun, but now it's becoming a nuisance, Alan said as he brought Diana closer to give her a quick kiss. What a shame Diana replied to the kiss. They went from trying to kill each other to loving each other out of nowhere, fortunately, no one except Alan's girlfriends was watching, or people would fall out of their seats. After the kiss, Alan allowed Diana to back away and increase the concentration of his hacky on his sword even more. Diana raised her alertness, Although she knew Alan wouldn't hurt her, it was true that Alan wouldn't hold back. Diana smiled, and a layer of blue energy surrounded her, she had removed a bracelet. The origin of these bracelets usually varies from universe to universe, while in some, they are said to be shields for Diana, in others, like this one, they have a different purpose. And that is to contain Diana's true power. In this world, Diana's origin was very different, she was born from mud like all her Amazon sisters, but unlike all of them, Diana received the blessing and blood of many goddesses. It could be said that Diana is the daughter of several goddesses, this is not as strange as it sounds, remember that in mythology Athena was born from the head of Zeus. Unfortunately, that power was too much for her to control, 
so it was sealed away. Alan knew that his Diana wasn't weak, that's why he didn't hold back against her. Quasar. Alan launched a wave of energy toward Diana, this technique was based on Garp's galaxy impact but in a sword version. It was something simple that Alan came up with during his training, but it had incredible power. Diana smiled as she looked at her man. While she was more accustomed to modern customs, she was still an ancient warrior woman at heart. Having the man she chose to be as strong as her or even stronger was something that filled her with satisfaction. I love you. But Diana smiled as she removed the other bracelet. Equals equals equals. Gwen, very epic and all, but... Am I the only one who sees that ring on Diana's finger MJ, ha ha ha, what are you saying, Gwen that's impossible. It's obviously an Amazon accessory. Natasha, he he, that's right. I didn't raise a piece of shit who would dare to get engaged to a woman without telling the woman who raised him. Yufufufu. Wednesday, you brought it upon yourself. 